What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Reel Me In, colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, we're going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and well, anything about movies. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chase Lee, and hey guys, listen, if you were stumbling across the internet and you were looking for a movie podcast to start with, or you just wanted to l- l- look at a podcast that talks about movies in general, and you actually stumbled into our house, and you have no idea what's going on, you're confused, you're like, well, what kind of party is this? Don't worry, you are welcome. Come into our house of movie knowledge, and we will uh, make you want to stay, because we are passionate about movies here, and we want to make you passionate as well, especially if you are not a fan of movies. That is our whole goal, to make you be one. If you are new to the show, welcome once again. If you are a returning listener, we welcome you as well. What we typically do is we'll go over some movie news, some movie trailers that drop throughout the week and commentate on on them for you guys. And then we'll have have reviews of movies that drop on the weekend and then box office results to accompany it. This is episode 222 and on this week's episode, we will be going over Love, Simon, the new uh, film from 20th Century Fox. And then of course... Uh, the Tomb Raider reboot, reimagining, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, with Alicia Vikander. So that is uh, going to be a short review from my co-host over there. And uh, speaking of my co-host, he's over there. He's ready to go. Uh, that would be Joel, Joseph Copeland. Um, and he is ready to uh, start the week. So, uh, Joel, how are, we, how are we doing this week? This week was, was exhausting. I had five sh- uh, closing shifts in a row. Like the night, the night of our previous... Um, podcast i had a closing shift and then i i closed every day after that until thursday and so i'm still feeling that because that's a lot of like there's a lot that goes into closing my store and you know five nights in a row it's just ugh. but anyway other than that you know I had a fun day um on friday because i saw tomb raider and uh thoroughbreds which i'm not reviewing thoroughbreds on the show but everybody needs to go see thoroughbreds it's a top 10 contender for me um, and then yesterday just kind of lounged around today. I'm doing, um, this, and then I'm watching Thor and Captain America in my revisit of the, um, Marvel's cinematic universe. I'm doing the first two, uh, phases for my website. So, um, anyway, and speaking of which, that was another thing. Like I, I, I had watched in, um, uh, Iron Man two again and liked it a lot more this time. So I have a review for that up on my website now. And, uh, yeah, super, super fun weekend after a tiring week. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and also the only reason it was tiring this week is this was the first official week with the, uh, the terrible daylight savings time. Uh, yeah, switch, it, so. <laughs> it was the worst week to do five closing shifts in a row after losing an hour. Ugh. It was so, yeah, it was yeah, crazy. Absolutely awful. And I, I, uh, I didn't really do much this week. Um, just watch my shows. Uh, that I watch on a weekly basis. Uh, so if you're ever curious uh, as to what I'm watching right now, uh, hold on to your pants because this is what I watch. Um, it was a mixture of This Is Us, Ash vs. Evil Dead, and Unreal. So a Lifetime show, a violent show, and uh, a, a really sad, dramatic show. So now you guys know where my uh, my tastes lie. Uh, also, I caught up with uh, a film from last year that Joel suggested, Trophy. That is really great. That is on Netflix right now. Um, yes, yeah, it's 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 uh, it punches you in the gut. Let's just, let's just say yes, that. it does. It's it's I cannot believe it didn't like take off more, uh, yeah. you know, fully last year. It's so strange that you know it didn't make it to the Oscars. It wasn't really a, a thing that it showed up in critics lists that I saw. You know, except for mine and and Mark's, um, it, well, Mark's, you know, uh, um, honorable mentions. You know, in, in any in any way like the critics awards programs and stuff they they didn't have that and it just seems so weird to me it's just like it slipped through the cracks and in any other year where there were i guess fewer high profile documentaries you'd think uh it would it would you know you kind of make it you know the in the big time you know be mentioned a lot and then nominated at the end of the year but it just kind of slipped through the cracks, and and it's very sad because it's a great movie. Yeah, for sure. it's, I mean, because you you figure like with the whole you know Cecil Lyons situation that happened recently, it's like you figure that would be more in the forefront uh, in voters' eyes, but I guess it wasn't. Um, but it took just real quick. It took um, you know trophy hunting and actually made it more complex than I ever thought it would. Like there were actually different right. uh, like pockets and corners of that industry and that kind of um, you know organization that like 
There are people that do it for ego. There are people that do it to actually save some of the animals so they aren't poached illegally. Like it's so complex. Like I was actually kind of shocked that they they went in many different directions. But I I, I really enjoyed it. That was the best thing I saw this week. Uh, besides. Um, uh, Monday screening, which, you know, I'm not going to review on this show, but it's terrible. Um, but if you want to go to my YouTube <laughs> channel and watch my 20 minute review of me just like ranting and raving about this like a lunatic, uh, The Leisure Seeker, Seeker with uh, Donald Sutherland and Helen Mirren is probably uh, one of the worst things I've seen this year. And that's saying a lot because uh, uh, I've seen some garbage things this year. And that <laughs> one, that one's, oh, good lord, that one's up there. Um, Yeah, it looks completely unappealing to me. I, I... Oh, it's bad. It, it, I, I, <laughs> I guess I should just reveal that uh, Chase Chase invited me, and then I was like, "Yeah, I have no interest." <laughs> yeah, so. I invited I invited him. I invited my girlfriend. No one wanted to see it, and you know why? Because it's atrocious. And I've never done this in the history of my entire YouTube channel. I actually did spoilers at the end of my review because I was like, "You guys need to understand what I'm talking about." Like it, it it's bad. So go to my YouTube yeah. channel if you want to check that out and uh, give, give the thing a like and a view. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, my week was pretty great, and I can't wait to talk about Love, Simon finally because we saw this what seems like a year ago. So uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I, I'm I'm kind of disappointed in one aspect of it, and I'll get to the box office results when uh, we talk about it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do that. So Joel, if you're ready, sir, let's go ahead and get this started. Um, there was a lot of news that dropped this week, and there were a couple of you know big trailers, and so. I'm excited to kind of jump into this. Joel, Steven Spielberg, he, you would say that he's one of your, your favorites, correct? Oh, yeah, for sure. So does it surprise you that the man just works on like three or four projects at once? <laughs> it doesn't at this point because he, he just is one of the hardest working people in the industry, uh, if not the most hardworking. Although probably not because Danny Trejo like shoots 17 movies a year or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in any case, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. This guy's got uh, so many projects, you know, in the pipeline. So obviously, you know, he's making the rounds with Ready Player One right now. He went to South by, um, and I hear that that screening re- went really well, despite a uh, technical glitch that was interesting to hear about. But now we're hearing, you know, Indiana Jones Five is going to be his next movie. He's shooting that next year for a July 2020 release. So he's taking a year off. I I, I can tell. Um, or I guess a couple years off, really, from the from when he shot the post. Um, and then you know we've been hearing about what his movie after that's going to be for a long time, and it seemed like he was going to be doing that Edgardo Martara kidnapping thing, uh, but he couldn't find an actor, and then he was going to be remaking West Side Story. But now it seems that after Indiana Jones Five, he is going to be doing something surrounding West Side Story, but it isn't a remake of that movie, at least not yet. He's going to be uh, filming a biopic for Leonard Bernstein, who wrote the music for West Side Story. Uh, And it's a very interesting story. uh, Bernstein was a uh, closeted gay man who was married to a Chilean-born American actress um, named Felicia Con Montealegre. I I, I think I got that correct. Um... And, uh, yeah, I mean, Bernstein was a giant, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, I think that this could absolutely be a really compelling story. It's interesting that it's going to be Spielberg that directs this, because this doesn't seem like his, you know, his usual uh, project, but I'm down for anything for, from him. So I'm, I'm super excited, um, and I'm excited to see him do a musical whenever he actually takes up, because it'll be interesting if he does the biopic of the guy who wrote West Side Story and then follows that up with a remake of West Side Story uh, would be would be very fun. So, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, things are heating up for him, and I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, that's what's great about Spielberg, man, is that he will do a blockbuster, and then he'll do a smaller film, and then he'll have, like, five blockbusters on the horizon, but, like, three smaller films, and it's like, the guy can just do anything at this point, and to... to uh, Go off of the what you said about the South by screening. It actually worked in its favor because they said from the people that saw it during the climax in the film, the the music was so loud that's what bursted the speakers. And so I guess it actually it works in its favor in terms yeah. of a marketing standpoint. It's like what? Like the speakers blew out like on its climax. Like that's that's pretty cool. Um, that's crazy. The guy is seventy one, <laughs> and I mean it's insane. It's insane. He just yeah. He just keeps going and going and going, and I, I just, yeah, I, I can't wait for Ready Player One. Um, 
I guess spoiler, I'm I'm not going to be on that episode, but I'm seeing it during my vacation in a couple weeks, and I I just I have so much respect for the guy. Um, his work ethic is intimidating, so I, I I'm I can't wait to see whatever you know everything that he has. Uh, yeah, I in store I, I, feel, for us. I feel bad because I don't know much about um you know Bernstein, but uh, just the fact that he's doing something different, just adding another you know interesting slot to his filmography. Come on, that that's just it's Spielberg, man. But you know who is another great hardworking man in the industry that doesn't get as much love as Spielberg, but hopefully one day he will when he's on his deathbed. Um, is Jake Gyllenhaal? Um, he teamed up with Dan Gilroy in uh, two thousand and was it fourteen? Right? Yes, two thousand fourteen with Nightcrawler, uh, which was one of my favorites of that year. I absolutely love that movie, and uh, it just another showcase of why Jake Gyllenhaal is the best. Now. He has not worked with uh, Dan Gil- Gilroy since until now. They're going to be doing a film for Netflix called on uh, what is it called? Ensemble. Ensemble. Yes, and um, this one there's not really much to it. It's just it's kind of about uh, con artists, uh, <laughs> artists, collectors, yada yada yada. Um, you know, kind of like that world of art collecting. And I don't know much about it, but I just know that with these two teaming up. It's a no-brainer. I, Nightcrawler was one of the, like I said, the best of that year. It had such great atmosphere, really great tension building, and one of the best performances of uh, Joan Hall's career for sure. I have no issues with this. They could literally make anything they want. They could make a goofy, goofy-ass comedy that looks stupid on its surface, and I will still go see it just because of that one, <laughs> one hit. However, I don't know if uh, Dan Gilroy... Gilroy is kind of facing a Duncan Jones situation where is he just a one-hit wonder? Because a lot of people didn't really care for Roman J. Israel Esquire. I can't really comment because I didn't see it, but a lot of the people that Joel and I follow didn't really care for the movie, and that was his big follow-up. So, I mean, Joel, i got to ask you, like, first of all, are you excited for this, and are you scared that Dan Gerwoy is kind of a one-hit wonder like a Duncan Jones uh, in many ways? Because, yes, Duncan Jones, you know, uh, with Moon and Source Code, great for sure, but like he's starting to kind of fall off the wagon a little bit. And it's like, is he really as talented as we thought he was? Is Dan Gil- Gilroy in that situation? It is. Well, we'll have to see because I didn't see Roman J. Israel Esquire. Our friend Mark is a fan of the movie. So there are people who do appreciate it, um, but I, I just can't comment on it myself. I know that it wasn't very popular. It's got like a 50 on Metacritic or something, um, you know, and not not a great not a great score because it, it's hard to get something like that on Metacritic. So I don't know. Um, with this though, it could be that Netflix turns out to be a great uh, outlet for them. Um, I love Jalen Hall. I, I was a big fan of Nightcrawler. Um, that one was almost. I think actually was it on my top ten. It might have been right outside my top ten. Whatever the case, it was it was pretty high up there for that uh, for that year for me. And um, and speaking of our friend Mark, it was on his top ten that year. So he's he's obviously a fan of Gilroy's. I, I think I think it's interesting because um, you know you see all these directors kind of moving toward Netflix and then kind of falling on their butts because Netflix keeps taking on projects that are kind of not very interesting. They're the new direct to video in terms of their features. You know, their narrative features, I should say. Um, it, it, it's it's interesting to see them move toward that. You know, for every Mudbound, you have, you know, The Outsider and Mute and, uh, you know, Bright and all that. And all these really not very interesting uh, concepts. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. I'm, I'm certainly interested in, in the material uh, and in the pairing based on their previous work together. But... Yeah, we'll we'll have to see. Uh, you know, what we'll also have to see. Even though I I don't know if I want to see it. Um, well, no, hold, Joel. Do not <laughs> lie to our audience. You texted me. I think it was a couple days ago, and you had the heart eyes emoji, and you said, "I'm looking. I'm not looking forward to any more movie like more than Die Hard Origin." And you know, it, it kind of shocked me at first, but then I was like, uh, I, "I okay, I'll roll with it." And so. You know, Joel expresses his love for it. He loves the idea of an origin story for Die Hard, and so I know he's really excited to announce this. Chase, you you lying liar from Liarsville. 
Um, okay, so this is the weirdest thing in the world, considering that they're about to hire a director who is considered to have kind of ruined the franchise. <laughs> and it wasn't, and it wasn't uh, John Moore with A Good Day to Die Hard. It was Lynn Wiseman because of the fact that he made a PG-13 Die Hard movie where John McClane was basically uh, an invisible superhero because he was able to launch his car at a hel- helicopter and all of that, take down a fighter jet. He was, it, it's just the most, it was the dumbest thing in the world. Both of those movies are pretty dumb. Um, but it seems that Wiseman is about to direct and produce a sort of kind of prequel that focuses on a younger John McClane. Uh, and they have gotten the two two of the writers of The Conjuring, Chad and Carrie Hayes, to rewrite the screenplay that already exists. Um this is weird. This is really, really weird. I, I, it's such a strange pairing. It's like they were just looking for people who wanted to work on a movie, but it, it's just it's just very strange um, that this exists either. I, I just think that this franchise needs to die, especially after A Good Day to Die Hard, which literally had no plot. Uh, there was no there was a premise, but there was not a plot. It was it was it was amazing. And um, anyway, I, I'm I'm not interested in this. I'm not interested in a young John McClane. He was he was a completely mortal, utterly completely mortal. Every man in the first movie, and now we have four sequels already. And you know, two of them were good. I, I liked Die Hard too. I liked Die Hard with a Vengeance. I, I thought that both of those were. Were good solid uh, sequels, not as not as good as the first one, but they were they were good sequels. And then you had them kind of crap the bed with uh, Live Free and Good Day, <laughs> um, and now you have this. It's just very strange. Um, I, I I don't know. It, it's it'll probably take place in the seventies, I guess, um, considering around the time. 1988 or whatever when the first one came out i think it was set in present day i think they all they all have been so it'll probably be the 70s when this is set um and i'm just not interested I, I, he's just a regular cop and he's not that much more interesting than any other cop except for the fact that he's the you know the face of a movie franchise that's that's literally it and he's not a superhero he doesn't need an origin story we don't need to learn what made him into the regular cop that he became so not interested chase uh, i know that this is the thing that you're most interested for in the next 25 years so tell us why definitely not avengers <laughs> infinity war all right so uh <laughs> yeah like what is his origins going to be the boring parts of hot fuzz where they're writing out reports and stuff like what is he gonna do i just i don't understand i i don't know why they're getting these writers to do punch-ups as if like this is a real movie. Stop making this a real movie. It's fake. This is a this is a funny watch, die sketch. Just stop watch it. John McClane hold a desk job. I was just like, yeah. What is he gonna do? Answer phone calls all day? Like, uh, yeah, he's gonna be like um uh Will Ferrell and the uh, the the uh the other guys. Um, yeah. So yeah. That, that's what I imagine like his character will be like. So I don't. I could care less about this. Um. <laughs> but uh, Joel actually made a, uh, a a good pun, and he didn't even realize it. He said that this franchise needed to go die. Congratulations, <laughs> uh, Die Hard, go die from Joel Copeland, 2018. Well, it was like the people who said that <clears throat> the word hard did not need to be in the title for A Good Day to Die Hard. Just A Good Day to Die. <laughs> a Good Day to Die. <laughs> so that's a great way to end that segment. All right, so this next segment uh, I decided to throw – oh, and by the way – uh, when I do the notes, I purposely, so you guys just know this up front, I'm being honest with you, I purposely give Joel the dumb stories. I purposely do that just to watch him squirm, and guess what? He does the same thing to me when he creates notes, so it works out. Um, I, when I was doing the notes yesterday, I, I was like... I quit. I'm just kidding. I was like, because <laughs> I was with my girlfriend, I was doing the notes, I was like, I was like, uh, um, all right, so I'm doing this diehard story of... Oh, Die Hard Origins, are you interested? And she's like, no. And I was like, okay, I'm going to give Joel that story. <laughs> like, he'll love it then. Uh, all right, so wow. the next story uh, involves some big heavy players in the directing and acting world. And it's 
It makes perfect sense since I just saw The Leisure Seeker and I still respect the woman, even though that movie's garbage. Um, Helen Mirren and Ian McKellen. Uh, Ian McKellen feels like he's been out of the game for a while. And uh, director Bill Condon are teaming up for The Good Liar, um, which is going to be uh, an adaptation. And it's kind of like a thriller. And I, I kind of like this uh, uh, premise, especially when you have uh, actors of this, not only caliber, but this age range. The fact that they're going kind of... Um, skewing this older and not adapting it to people younger, I think it's great. It's kind of like a like a cat and mouse uh, type of thriller where we're going to have a bunch of back and forth uh, type of deal. We're dealing with a con artist uh, that's going to be played by McKellen, and he can't resist one last score because, hey, what con artist can't? Um, and he meets his... Uh, 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 he meets a, a widow online, which is played by Marin, and um, she kind of opens up her life to him and all that stuff. I, it could be uh, interesting. Um, I, I like the uh, director-actor uh, combo here. My only question is: Is this going to be? Is this going to be kind of you know taken more seriously, or is this going to be like kind of goofy, like Red and like Red Two type of deal, where they're going to take it over the top and it's just going to not really seem. Like these actors type of films or whatnot. I, I don't know. But as far as like the team up goes, uh, I am interested only because I feel like I haven't seen Ian McKellen in years. Like I feel like he went into like some slumber for a decade and now he's like coming back and doing stuff. He's probably done stuff by the way. And I'm just being oblivious. But um, I the Hobbit, the... the Hobbit movies and he he was um, you didn't really see him much, but he was in Beauty and the Beast. He was the that's uh... true. Yeah. The clock, uh, I believe. Well, and, and that's yeah. probably why uh, Bill Condon wants to work with them because Bill Condon, um, you know, directed. Yeah, he's movie, he's so. he's worked with him for years. He did uh, way back to Gods and Monsters in the late oh, 90s. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, that was his first movie, I believe, and it, mm-hmm. and it had McKellen, and he was nominated for it. Um, so that's, yeah, that's right. yeah. So this is so this is certainly a um, you know project because they're obviously friends, and so. You know, he wants an older man to play a con artist. Perfect cool. cast. Yeah, perfect casting. Uh, yeah. I, I think that this is great casting. There's such a wry quality to Ian McKellen that I think uh, works well. You know, I, I don't think I've ever seen him play a con artist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if he ever has, but he's he's got this like wry kind of sardonic quality that I think uh, lends itself well to con artistry. And I think that I think that this could be great. And it's a great cast pairing. Um, you know, I'm sure that they've done something together before, but um, Ian McKellen and Helen Mirren. I mean, it's <laughs> that's a great that's a great cast pairing. So I'm I'm looking forward to this. I like the I like movie about movies about con artists when they're done well. Uh, hopefully, this is one that that is. Um, so we shall see. I'm I'm a huge fan of The Handmaiden from a couple years ago. Love Matchstick Men. Uh, the Grifters uh, from 1990 is a great one. Probably my favorite uh, currently. And um, Anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that like Ian McKellen has, um, he kind of has like that sleuthy uh, type of con artist feel, like especially when he was playing like Magneto when he played more sinister roles. Like he can definitely, uh, he, he's definitely that type of actor to where he's likable. He can reel you in and then just screw you over with some type of like plan that he's gonna uh, have to screw you over. He seems like the perfect uh, guy to do this. Um, uh, but yeah, no, uh, I I want to see Helen Mirren bounce back from, like I said, whatever the hell I just watched on Monday. So, uh, Joel, uh, did you like Cor- did you like Coraline? Did you like Coraline? I love Cor- I love Coraline. That's actually my favorite Leica movie so far. Oh, did you know that uh, t- t- uh, Tim Burton directed that, right? Because uh, Tim Burton <laughs> also directed Nightmare Before Christmas. Cause you remember. <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, uh, it is directed and by Tim Burton. Henry directed P- Tim Burton directed Monkey Bone and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and James of the Giant Peach. Exactly. I'm just kidding. Henry Selick has um, done nothing in his career. <laughs> absolutely nothing. Yeah. So this is really exciting. I, I'm I'm a huge fan of this story. Um, actually, kind of looking through this might be my favorite. Um, might be my favorite story. I agree. So <laughs> yeah, this is really exciting. It's called Wendell and Wild, and it's uh, going to be on Netflix. It comes from Henry Selick, who's going to direct and co-write the screenplay with Jordan Peele. Uh, that's quite the pairing. I'm, I'm, I like that a lot. Um, and then Peel is obviously going to be co-starring with Keegan Michael Key, and this is a great story, and I can't wait. And it's because of this plot: two scheming demon brothers who must face their arch nemesis, the demon dusting nun Sister Helly, 
and her two acolytes, the goth teens Kat and Raul. I cannot wait for more casting because if they get perfect casting for this, this is going to be a total gem. I'm a huge fan of this, especially in the wake of you know Jordan Peele winning an Oscar for writing a screenplay. I mean, that's that's a huge get. Uh, this is, I think, like the second um, stop motion. It's obviously going to be stop motion. This is the second stop motion that went, uh, that Netflix has um, has ordered because they're doing Bubbles, mm. which is uh, Ty- the Taika Waititi movie about uh, Michael Jackson's chimp. Um, <laughs> so clearly, when they go for uh, <laughs> when they go for stop motion animation, they probably just tell the people doing it, "Please make this the weirdest movie ever made." That, that would be great. Just do that. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this idea, this, this premise, uh, a big fan of Leica. I, I don't know if this is going to be, you know, at all involving Leica, but it's going to be involving an artist who's worked with them and, and done a movie for them. And I've liked all of their movies so far. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this. Whenever it comes out, I can't wait. So. You, you actually brought up a good point because, as much as like you know Joel, myself, and like most of film fans love Leica Entertainment, they do not do well at the box office. And I have a feeling after um, uh, Kubo and the Two Strings, Travis Knight, who was kind of the you know founder and kind of you know proprietor of this you know company, his dad uh, was involved with Nike, so they're super loaded. And so he basically asked his dad, which I'm I I don't really like uh, when rich kids ask their parents for money, but you know what he created some greatness with that. So I will excuse that. Um, and he created like a, they didn't do well at the box office. So he actually had his dad funnel more money to keep the operations open so he can continue to make, make more movies. But the thing is out of four movies they've done, it's just like, they're not doing well. So it doesn't surprise me if like a moves to Netflix or moves, moves to some streaming platform and just does movies from that uh, standpoint so that actually is yeah and you know we know we know so little about this project that it may be that there's some sort of deal going on currently to move like a netflix it could mm-hmm. be that they're officially doing that yeah uh and we just haven't heard about it yet because there's not you know there's not anything in stone uh, i wouldn't be surprised if i heard that because obviously netflix has this like super secretive way of making money <laughs> right um <laughs> they borrow it from the mafia i don't know uh <laughs> um no, but it, obviously they're so insanely rich that that they just maybe they just print their own money. I I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> in any case, uh, obviously you know they're able to do a lot of this stuff, and I think that they could probably just buy Leica. Uh, they probably it, could. It, it it can't you know in terms of um, production companies, it can't cost very much. Um, you know, especially after the the box office failures they've had. And uh, but they are a great company. Like yes. box office, box office doesn't determine anything except for numbers. And they are a very worthy company. And and it would behoove Netflix to make an offer, I, I, I think. And um, and uh, you know even if it isn't happening now, it'll probably happen at some point that somebody's going to buy them out, and then they'll be able to make their movies, um, you know, with money. And yeah. um. But right now, yeah, you're right. They're really they're really running on Nike money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, hey, listen, that's not a bad thing. Hey, listen, if, if uh, you go to your dad and you, you tell him to fund, you know, this this great studio, I'm all for that because stop motion animation employs uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. So please uh, keep it afloat. I'm, and I'm going to make a very strange request of our uh, audience. Uh oh. To to help Leica go out now and buy Nike shoes. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a, it's the circle of life, people. Um, no, uh, I, I like this circle news. of capitalism. There yeah, exactly. No, I, I like this news quite a bit. And now this is going to be weird, but this is going to be the first uh, trailer to a movie that in- involves Jordan Peele to where they can go. Academy Award, Academy Award winner, winner Jordan, Jordan Peele. Peele. <laughs> like that's going to be so cool. Um, but him paired up with Keegan Michael T- Key, that's that's just gold in a bucket. I, I just I love those pairing Henry Selleck. Listen, all these people out there, they have this uh, uh, misconception of uh, uh, who directed um, 
you know, Nightmare Before Christmas because Tim Burton's name is on there. He produced it, folks. He did not direct it. Henry Selleck directed it. He directed James and the Giant Peach. He directed Coraline. The guy is a talented director, and he doesn't get any credit, and no one knows who he is. So I'm yeah. hoping <laughs> that our, our, our listeners out there go spread the word and tell them that Henry Selleck exists. He exists. He's he, a real he person. Is, he is not the household name he should be because, no. you know, Monkey Bone isn't very good, but it's interesting. No. It's interesting as kind of a as kind of a bad movie. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's not awful, I don't think. But James and the Giant Peach, Nightmare Before Christmas, Coraline, all excellent. Yes. And I I think that he should be a household name. People should know who he is off the top of their head. And unfortunately, unless you're a real film fan, you know somebody who kind of you know d- uh, does deep dives into this stuff, you won't know who he is. Like, I, I'm gonna make a bold, I'm gonna make a bold statement and. Uh, Joel can make gross faces if he wants to, but Henry Selleck to me is like the Miyazaki of stop motion. Like he yes. is that good. And yes. so I, people please search out like who he is and like what he's done because yes, Burton's name was on there, but like that, that's just, um, yeah, yeah he just, he just fine. He just financed it. He Correct. obviously, you know, was involved in the production, but it's not, it's, it's Henry not, Selleck's not movie. Vision. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, Henry Selleck's movie and it, yeah, but so. I, I I can't wait. Regardless, I mean, I I could watch that man stop motion any movie he wants, especially since his last one was uh, Coraline, which I I believe it, it sometimes it, it it's on the fence with me uh, because it's either Coraline or Paranorman is my favorite Leica movie so far. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, if he can just continue on that Coraline path, I'm totally down for it. But uh, hey, you know what? This was surprising news, Joel. Where, where you know where it's like, oh hey, Henry Z- Selleck is making a new movie. You know what else is surprising is the fact that Rob Zombie made another movie and no one even knew about it. So they're actually in the middle of filming right now, three uh, three from hell. Uh, and you're probably like, what is this? So Rob Zombie is directing it, writing it, producing it, doing all that stuff like he normally does. And it's going to be the third film in the Devil's Reject uh, Rejects uh, House of a Thousand Corpses franchise. Now. Uh, this is exciting news to me because I really enjoy the devil's rejects. I think it is definitely his best one. Uh, from what I've seen, there's a couple of movies I still haven't seen from him, like Lords of Salem. But, uh, as far as actually directing a competent movie with interesting characters who have like the soul of blackness and, you know, these are just killing machines. They're just psychopaths that, you know, provide this movie with like such gritty atmosphere and such sadistic, you know, uh, tendencies that it just it makes you feel uncomfortable. It's definitely one of his best, and it, it has a uh, uh, one of the better endings I've seen um, from a Rob Zombie movie. Which it's not saying a lot, but you know, it's definitely a more powerful one than most. But I like this news uh, because, like I said, love Devil's Rejects. Eper and Robert, uh, we were just talking about this before we recorded. Gave it two thumbs up, and so you know that. If people like that liked it, um, and I liked it, please search it out and give it a shot. Um, but that's cool. So if he's in the middle of shooting, hopefully it won't take too long. Maybe if they can get it done pretty quickly, I would say that Zombie would probably put this out towards Halloween time, maybe October ish, if they can, you know, uh, you know, edit it pretty quickly and it's probably got minimal CGI and stuff. So um, yeah. Super stoked. Uh, it's a surprise. Great surprise, though, for for me. Because um, I want to see him kind of continue on this franchise. Uh, especially after the ending of number... Uh, yeah, The Devil's Reject. So, uh, Joel, I know you and I were discussing this. You haven't really seen these movies. But um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of want to hear your, your hot take for a second. Like, this is Joel's Corner. Hot take, Joel. Uh, <laughs> please tell me... Because you and I haven't really discussed Rob Zombie as a filmmaker. Do you like any of his movies at all? <laughs> The only one that I've seen is The Lords of Salem, ironically oh enough, and I, yeah, and I didn't like that movie at all. So I, I don't really have any oh, wow. super duper feelings. I'm gonna be seeing his Halloween movies uh, this year because of the Halloween reboot that mm. uh, David Gordon Green's doing, and I've only seen the original first movie. So I'm gonna be seeing all of them just to kind of catch up. And um, even though I know you know they're ignoring a lot of them uh, for that movie, I, I just want to I just want to see them to see them. Um, so I guess that this will also, you know, if he puts it out sometime around Halloween, uh, then this will give me a chance to finally rent, uh, House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects, both of which I've had interest in. 
uh, in the past. I've, I've heard good things about both. I just haven't seen them. Um, so I don't really have any feelings about this. I'm, I'm happy for the fans of the previous movies that they're going to get another one because I know that it does have fans. Um, that you know, he his his films have people who appreciate them. So certainly he he is uh, <laughs> an interesting voice. I just didn't like Lords of Salem at all. I, and, I yeah, I it was it was weird, like off putting kind of in a, in a boring way. Um, uh, visually interesting, but yeah, I I don't know. Well, it's one of those things. Like I I I'm not saying that Rob Zombie is like some epic director that you know is like Oscar worthy or whatever. He just, he like, it's like you say, he's got an interesting voice on how he portrays people and violence and kind of like adds like this realness factor to it. Cause he takes, he takes characters that you could actually see in real life. And I think that's what makes it terrifying. It's kind of like with the devil's rejects where it's like, these are, th- it follows three psychopaths and you can see these crazy ass people like running around the desert somewhere, like almost like Hills have eyes almost. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those things to where uh, I, I get it. He's kind of a controversial filmmaker. Um, uh, I, I'm not like I'm not saying like you know he's like top five of all time, but I've enjoyed you know Devil's Rejects. Uh, I need to re see House of a Thousand Corpses. That the first Halloween that he did wasn't bad. It wasn't terrible. It was a it was a different take on Michael Myers, which I appreciate. I wanted it different from the original just to see a fresh voice on it. The sequel was awful. Uh, it involved like some unicorn. Uh, that's why I remember <laughs> watching in the, the theater. It was not good at all. So, um, yes, great news uh, for all you fans out there. Now, Joel, there, there's been a couple of interesting uh, news pieces that involve uh, directors and uh, comic uh, franchise. What's going on over there? Yeah, it's really strange because um, y- you have two filmmakers who are pretty popular and partly made their name with um, – you know, kind of politically charged movies, and um, they're both black filmmakers, and they're potentially taking on you know comic book franchises. So, for the DC side, you have um, Ava DuVernay, who is uh, likely to take on um, the New Gods for DC. Uh, the New Gods. I'm just going to read this, so because this will uh, sound like nonsense. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The New Gods was the genesis of the uber-villain Darkseid, also called Fourth World. The Kirby creation debuted in a trilogy of related comics written and drawn by Kirby that were published in the very early 1970s. New Gods, New Gods, Forever People, and Mr. Miracle. The New Gods came into existence after the world of the gods of classic mythology were destroyed during Ragnarok. Ooh. Um, the deities inhabit two planets. One is New Genesis, the lush paradise, and the other is Apocalypse. Uh, which sounds like Dante's version of hell. War ensues. And Apocalypse, of course, is spelled A-P-O-K-O-L-I-P-S. Um, what a great what a great spelling. Uh, I think I'm just going to write the word Apocalypse like that from now on because it's funny. Um, so this is really cool. Uh, I know that you know she, she had been attached for some time to Black Panther. Uh, and I know that she is a comic book fan. So it'll be interesting to see her finally take on a project like this. Uh, you know, especially after, you know, like I said last week, Wrinkle in Time was more of a Jennifer Lee and Jeff Stockwell problem than it was an Ava DuVernay problem. Uh, she directed it well. It was the screenplay that was that was the issue. And so I'm excited to see her work with another big budget. You know, hopefully she has a better screenplay attached to that um, because it could really work. I'm, I'm a fan of that. Um, and then you have Spike Lee, who is obviously an even bigger name um, in the world of, you know, political filmmaking. And he's taking on for Marvel in the um, I think in the Venom the Venom universe um, a Night Watch movie. Uh, now I am kind of not really aware of who Night Watch is, uh, and the article that I'm looking at doesn't really seem to say. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I know that he's an African American uh, scientist uh, who becomes a superhero. Uh, Kevin Trench is his name. Um, but really all I know is that he is, he is, um, witnessed, uh, a man who witnessed a costume crusader die battling terrorists. Uh, and then he, oh, okay, here it is. I'm sorry. It says it. So, and then he unmasks the corpse and finds that it's an older version of himself. 
uh, which is very interesting. Wow. Okay, I did not see that when I saw this. <laughs> when I saw this article, I, I apologize. Live, live, uh, live show, folks. So this is cool. This is a really cool premise. Um, huge fan of that. I think that if he likely works with, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make this joke. This is kind of a deep cut joke, but there you go. Um, he's gonna work with a predominantly black cast and John Turturro. Um, <laughs> so, uh, cause he always works with John Turturro, it seems. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited for this. I, I think that this really could work, uh, especially if, you know, this is in the Venom universe and they're going to be going for an R rating, uh, because I think that he works best with an R rating. So, uh, we shall see, we shall, we shall certainly see, uh, what happens here. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing how that all turns out. Yeah, uh, just reading up on both of these before we started, uh, the new guides sound really interesting. You know, it's it's also fascinating to see Jack Kirby is the one that uh, created this, and he was primarily over at Marvel creating all those characters. So I'm I'm wondering like what happened uh, to where he wanted to shift over to DC and create those characters. Um, I have not seen a Wrinkle in Time, so I can't really comment on how Ava DuVernay directs in an epic scope. I've seen her smaller films like Thirteenth and Selma, so I know how she does on a kind of more intimate, independent level, but I've never seen uh, a bigger blockbuster from her, and I, I will get around to A Wrinkle of Time at some point, um, but her tackling that and being a comic book fan and almost doing Black Panther, it sounds great. Um, you know, and the the new gods kind of remind me of uh, Marvel when they talk about the, you know, the Watchers and the gods and the celestial beings in that universe, and so I get excited about that stuff because that that can um, really tackle some epic storytelling. So that, I'm cool with that. The Spike Lee thing is cool. Uh, I was reading up on Night Watch and he sounds like he sounds like a a cool character to kind of introduce in this universe. And Joel, you know that I'm crossing my fingers for Venom because that first trailer was just Tom Hardy yelling in a hospital bed. That's all it was, <laughs> um, and it didn't really explain much. And I don't mind teasing. I don't mind nipple teasing, but that was just that was teasing to a point to where it didn't t- tell me anything. Um, so yeah, if Venom is good, I'm all for this. Um, as far as Spike Lee goes, the last thing I saw from him was not good. It was Chirac. Um, and so if we're talking about what have you done for me lately, that was your last one. Not a fan, but I know that Spike Lee, despite some of the controversial stuff he says outside in interviews. <laughs> Um, I think he's a talented filmmaker, and if you can apply his kind of like grounded sensibilities in filmmaking and apply it to kind of you know this type of uh, character, I think you can have some really interesting character work. And he's done uh, action films before, uh, and you know suspenseful thrillers. I really liked his direction in Inside Man. I think that had a lot of great tension in there, and that could be applied to this. Uh, in in terms of like an action scope, and so I, I think this would be an interesting pick if they decide to go down this route. But I'm going to keep it real. Sony can throw all these plans up in the air as much as they want. They are waiting to see how Venom does. If Venom does very well, they're going to go full force with this um, kind of separate pocket universe uh, with the Spider-Man characters uh, outside of the MCU. Uh, because Disney does not want to be associated with R-rated stuff. But, no, I, I like uh, both pieces of news quite a bit. And, you know, it's funny that you said that uh, the Henry Selleck story was your favorite, because it's my favorite too. But, man, this next story, this last story, is just amazing. <laughs> so, Taika Waititi might be one of my favorite human beings to ever walk this earth. Uh, if you've ever seen him in any interviews, he's just a delightful human being. And so... Even prior to Thor Ragnarok, I've been a huge fan of this guy. You know, What We Do in the Shadows is a really great mockumentary. And The Hunt for the Wilder People, despite some of the end action sequences get, getting a little too campy, uh, a little too over the top, I still liked uh, the overall themes that were going on with, you know, finding yourself and, um, you know, uh, you know father-son relationships, uh, you know, with like Sam Neill and uh, Julian, uh, what, what's the uh, little boy's name? Uh, it's Julian something, right? Yes, yeah, Julian. I can't remember something. I'll look it up. <laughs> Joel is dead. All right. Um, no, uh, it, that was a really great movie. It was really tender, uh, funny, and also had really great dramatic weight. And guess what? That's exactly uh, what this one's going to be. So, uh, Taika Waititi. Denison. Julian Denison. Denison. That, I don't know why I was thinking Assange. Uh, that's the WikiLeaks <laughs> dude. Uh, uh, 
Uh, so, all right. Um, wow. No, uh, this one is called Jojo Rabbit, and Taika Waititi will direct it, and he's going to be playing Imaginary Hitler. Now, ho- hold on, folks. Hold on. Do not be throwing your pitchforks at me. So this is actually a pretty interesting premise. We have this 10-year-old boy who, uh, um, you know, kind of doesn't know who his father is type of deal. Um, and so <laughs> this is during World War II, and he imagines – himself joining the you know Hitler's ranks in World War II and so he has this imaginary Hitler that you know kind of pops up like in I don't know if it's going to be in ghost form or uh you know a hallucination or whatever you know real life form but he imagines a Hitler and on on the surface it seems like a pretty funny you know concept uh Watiti said that Hitler will be kind of goofy and charming uh in this movie but at the same time the imaginary Hitler is going to be representation for his father and how he imagines his father's kind of like uh, with a mixture of Hitler. So it's going to have a funny premise, but it have like a sweet, enduring like heart to it. And I think that's the most important thing about this story. Um, but Watiti directing it, great. I like the hunt for the wilder people and uh, the fact that he's playing uh, Adolf Hitler, great because he voiced uh, Korg in uh, you know Thor Ragnarok, and his comedic timing was spot on, just like it always is. So I like this story quite a bit, and I cannot wait to see uh, Jojo Rabbit. So uh, uh, Joel, uh, imaginary Hitler, you on board? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> oh whoops, no no no. So there's somebody on my on a Facebook group when I saw this uh, story pop up who said it really well, and I'm I'm just gonna be. I'm just going to come out with it. I'm just going to say this. It's an absolutely terrible idea that I completely trust Taika Waititi with. Um, I I think that only he could really make this work and commit to the exact sense of humor that he's talking about um, because this could go very, 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 very wrong. It it could. An an invisible – It couldn't, but – Right. An imaginary Hitler being funny and charming is quite a leap. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting. Um, I, I just, I have to see more to have any other thoughts, but yeah, this is going to be strange. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, if you guys have seen, you know, his other movies besides Thor Ragnarok, I, I trust him where it's like, you know, if I hear like some outrageous plot synopsis like this, if anyone else was doing this, I'd be a little wary, but you're right. I'm not going to give him a full pass, but I will say that I, I trust him for right now until we see like footage or, you know, photos. And it's like, my God, what are you doing? <laughs> but for yeah. right now, I think it's uh, in in his hands. It is fine. So uh, our favorite news story for the week is obviously the Henry Selleck one. I love anything stop motion because it is one of the hardest genres of film to do. I don't care what you say. Um, so that will uh, be amazing when it hit, finally hits Netflix, probably in like 500 years because those movies take forever to make. Um, all right. <laughs> So moving on to the trailers, uh, Joel, we had two of them that dropped that were pretty big, and you're going to start us off with the first one. Yeah, so the first one is Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. The trailer suddenly dropped this week. In fact, I think what was like the day before, you you had messaged me with like, oh man, a Fantastic Beast trailer will be will be out probably by Ready Player One. <laughs> Instead, we we got it this week. Um, so... Yeah, man, I'm 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 excited for this. So we get a little bit of a of a sense of the story, um, which you know we've talked about previously. But yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of this trailer. Uh, we get to see Jude Law as Dumbledore. He fa- he factors a lot into this. Um, we get to see a lot of of young Dumbledore, uh, or hot Dumbledore, as a friend of mine called him. Uh, well, I mean, come on, you know Jude Law. He's a he's a he's a good looking guy. Yeah, he is he is quite the specimen. Um, yeah. So, of course, uh, Newt's commander's headed to Paris. Uh, Dumbledore apparently knows this, and he's being questioned about that. But, you know, at the end, of course, we get a little bit of what I've been predicting this whole time, which is the likelihood that even though this series is headed toward a big fight between Dumbledore and Grindelwald, played by Johnny Depp, we're not going to see them together for a while because of the line of dialogue. And Chase knows what I'm talking about. There's um, where he basically gives Newt a job, kind of at the end of this trailer, and the re and and he and he kind of leads into that by saying, "I can't go against Grindelwald." And I talked 
in the past. Ouch! About uh, sorry, just <laughs> kick my foot. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, he's you know talked in the past about or I've talked in the past about the um, the the backstory uh, of Dumbledore and Grindelwald's history together and what's going to kind of color that about um, you know wh- why they're probably not going to be getting together to fight for a while um, and this sort of confirms that so I'm I'm super interested it's very much a tease it doesn't have a whole lot of material we don't see for instance who Jessica Williams is going to play uh, such strange casting um, uh, until until we see it and but we do you know we get a bit of a glimpse at Johnny Depp which you know thankfully the the advertising didn't focus a lot on him because he's he's got some he's got some skeletons in his closet and uh, he's not a he's not a very uh, he's a pretty controversial choice at this point uh, uh, to be cast in a movie, especially as a villain. And um, so we didn't we don't see a lot of him, and I think that that's pretty smart. I think that they should go forward with that, even though he's the title character. Um, you know, kind of make him not a big selling point, so that you know the people who aren't seeing the movie aren't bombarded with images of him. And then, you know, obviously people who are seeing it just kind of know he's in it. So um, good trailer, really good trailer. And I'm a, I'm a fan of that. Yeah, uh, I so, loved it. I, I, yeah. got a, I got a sense of the story, got a sense of the visual look, got a sense of the tone, got uh, the one glimpse. The, even though it was just a brief glimpse, um, I did like the one shot we did uh, get of Grindelwald. He was very menacing. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a great foil to Dumbledore. I have no issues with this trailer. It's like it's such a great tease to finally get me back into this universe. I love the uh, the Wizarding World of like Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts. But my issue with the first one was all it was was Newt going, "I must find my magical gopher over there in Central Park." I don't care about that. Go find your beast in another time, okay? You you, you got stuff to worry about right now, so. Um, I'm glad this is going to finally get into the heart of the matter of good versus evil at Hogwarts. Dumbledore, the I, God, like when they got when they got to the Hogwarts in the trailer, and they start going in the classrooms and stuff. I'm like, man, th- like this production design just takes you right back to Harry Potter. It's like, man, it, it feels like you're home, and uh, <laughs> absolutely loved it. Great tease sets sets you up and gives you enough of the story. Um, um, ahead of time. So yeah, it's going to play in front of Ready Player One. Ready Player One is a Warner Brothers product, so that makes sense to advertise it in front of there. Also to advertise in front of Ready Player One is going to be uh, this next one we're talking about. Joel, did you know that um, um, a comic book movie is coming out this year? No, I know it's super rare. Um, what? It, I, I know it's it's super rare, but we are going to be talking about one of the rare ones to come out in like 20 years. So uh, Avengers Infinity War, uh, it's uh, first and only trailer is going to drop because they're doing the Star Wars marketing, uh, which you do a teaser, a full couple TV spots, and that's it. Um, and so Kevin Feige is definitely taking the uh, uh, Kathleen Kennedy approach when it comes to marketing this movie, and they're keeping everything close to the vest, which I think is very good, especially when you have like this 10-year tease uh, on the horizon. So it's first full trailer dropped, and just like with the teaser, it doesn't reveal much but it does reveal uh, a couple new scenes. It reveals um, the underlying story of uh, Thanos, how he gets to Earth, uh, what he needs in terms of the stones. And I have a, I have this strange feeling that uh, uh, Wakanda in the trailer, the whole battle there, is going to be the final battle of the final stone, which is uh, <clears throat> the soul stone. Um, but that's just my <laughs> speculation. But in terms of the way it looks, it looks so epic. Uh, all the set pieces look fun. It just looks like if you were invested in this franchise for 10 years, this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful payoff. Uh, a couple of my favorite shots, uh, if I, uh, if I get to nerd out for a little bit, um, at the very end, uh, when Cap is holding back Thanos' hand and it looks like he is struggling, but also, uh, giving some force at the same time. It's amazing. Um, Hulk in the Hulkbuster suit, cause I believe that is him in the suit. That's cool. And um, I like the fact that they kind of amped up uh, Black Panther and Wakanda a little bit in this trailer, which I predicted after the crushing success of the movie. Um, it makes sense because the final battle will probably be there um, outside of the, you know, the Battle of New York. And so showing, you know, T'Challa and, you know, his army and stuff, it's just, it's epic, man. It's, it's cool. And so as a fan of this franchise, I cannot wait. Um, 
and I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, the comedy in the trailer too. I, I know this is a uh, supposed to be a devastating kind of epic finale almost to this storyline, but uh, there is some levity in the trailer, and it's you know really cool to see the Black Order uh, is in there. Um, uh, Thanos is kind of henchmen, and all of them have unique abilities that look terrifying, especially with the Doctor Strange uh, uh, therapeutic pin needle into the face thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's what that was. Uh, yeah, I was, I was like, yeah, I, I, I was like, man, that's got to have some sort of significance, and I totally just realized, yeah, it's a therapeutic pin needle to the face. That's that's pretty. That's <laughs> or, pretty crazy. Or was it uh, acupuncture or whatever? So <laughs> acupuncture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to think it's, of the name, but uh, yeah, it looked like he was having acupuncture. Uh, therapy, yeah, I mean, so. he's he's a he's a therapist, so I mean, certainly. Um, in any case, I'm I'm a huge fan of this trailer as well. Great, great stuff. Um, and you know, um. You're right. Great shots all around. The uh, it does definitely looks like it has levity. There was something you know a while ago when I was my cynical self, you know, worried about oversaturation of all this stuff. I was like, man, is this even going to have any stakes? And uh, <laughs> certainly, it looks like it's going to have stakes because I suspect, and this is just me. This is no not spoilers. Whatever. Oh well, well, Joel, I got my theories too on uh, who's who's going to die <laughs> and what's going to happen because they do oh, frame I, the trailer. I think it, they oh, framed the think, trailer in an interesting way. Yeah, I, I think, honestly, this is me. This is just me, guys. Um, I think that the people who are going to die are Iron Man, Thor, Incredible Hulk, and Captain America. I think that there might you be four. You think they're going to kill the main four off in this one? The first, the first four. I think that they're going to kill the first four. What? In, no. Not in, not, no, no, no. Not in just this movie. I, I mean just in this, like, the two parts. Oh, oh, for uh, sure. Okay, I agree yeah, with, yeah. I agree I'm with that. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, because what I think what's going to happen is uh, they're going to kill off the main, the the you know the big four, mm. and then leave phase four to the other characters, and then they're just going to cycle through them. So, because we know that Robert Downey Jr.'s contract ends, I think I've actually heard that it's with this movie. So he could he, it could be he dies in this movie. He he's dying uh, in this one. That is my theory because yeah. it, the final shot. Looks like Cap's going to die. There's a shot in the trailer where Thanos has got Thor by the head. It looks like he's yeah. going to die. Tony's untouched, and I have a feeling that that's a curveball that Disney's throwing at yeah. us, going, "Hey, I, I look at who could die." But it's like Tony's there's that probably there's that die. very brief shot of him kind of kneeling down, kind of looking up in a slow mo thing, uh, very pained or whatever. And it could be that that's right before he dies. Yeah, I, I, that's that's what I've been thinking. But I think that in these two movies, this one and then the unnamed one next year, yeah, uh, that they're gonna kill off the first four. And by the first four, I mean Iron Man, the Hulk. Thor and Captain America, the first four movies or the first five movies that came out in the in the franchise, um, because I think that it only makes sense. I think yeah. that you kill off the old guard, and the old guard in this case is those four. Now they could also, I guess, be like super super ballsy and also kill off War Machine, um, Black Widow, Hawkeye, uh, Falcon, Hawkeye, some and of the smaller ones. Yeah. Well, not Falcon. I'm, I'm talking about anybody from before the first Avengers. Oh, so, okay, gotcha. So War Machine was introduced in Iron Man 2, kind of. Um, and, it, you know, they could they could kill him off. But uh, then I guess they would wait to kind of kill a Falcon off for whatever the end of Phase 4 is. So that's what I think they're going to do. I think that, you know, we're reaching the end of a decade. Um, we're reaching the end of 11 years, basically, uh, next year with this franchise. And I think that... It would make sense for them to kind of kill off some of the old guard so that um, – and also there's another interesting element to this that I'm, I'm going to get into in a second. But they're going to kill off some of the old guard and then kind of leave the, the doors open for this new guard. Now, this is what's interesting. So we have this conversation going on culturally about the fact that we need more representation for minorities, women, the LGBTQ community, all of that. And what I think is interesting is the fact that it seems, in, it, you know, to certain circles, it seems like Marvel's kind of been behind the, the um, you know, sort of uh, late to the party on some of this stuff. You know, we're just getting our first Marvel uh, movie headlined by a female superhero next year. You know, that's 11 years after it started. We just got one uh, headlined by a black superhero where he wasn't a sidekick. And... So it's interesting to see that conversation take place now because I think what's going to happen is they're going to end off this phase three. They're going to basically kind of start over a bit 
with a new culture to lead into phase four. So now we get, we're going to get probably Black Panther 2 first. That's what I'm suspecting. I think that they're gonna, going to fast track that, maybe not first, but in 2020. That's, that's what I'm suspecting, that they're going to fast track a Black Panther 2 for 2020. So that is at least one of the first that comes out. We're also probably going to get a Spider-Man sequel. So that'll the, be the Spider-Man th- sequel is slated for next year. Oh, it's next year. Really? Yeah, the 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 three that are coming out next year are Captain Marvel, Avengers 4, and Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh, uh, okay. So I think that they're going to start I think that Spider-Man Homecoming is the start of Phase 4 then, right? Probably. So, yeah, yeah probably. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to have it in there. So, um it would it would end with the next Avengers. Um okay. So then that makes sense. So then you can have Spider-Man and then lead in with you know, after that, lead into the new decade with Black Panther two, you know, do some other sequel or something. Um, they still have Guardians three on the horizon. They have uh, Doctor Strange two on the horizon. Yeah, so I've, I have a feeling that Guardians three is going to be twenty twenty one. Maybe uh, that's that's what I'm guessing, unless they do that as like an August movie in twenty twenty mm. uh, or July. Uh, but yeah, that's what I think that they need to do. They need to kind of kill off some of the old guard. Um, you know, make room for these newer heroes who are a little more diverse, and uh, yeah, I, I, that's what I think is going to happen. So, uh, but yeah, great trailer, very epic. I like so, the. So uh, I have a, I have a couple or one thing for you. Uh, first thing for me, I cannot wait to see actual uh, the backstory on how uh, Thanos uh, captures Gamora because we see that in the trailer. We see her backstory as a child. Uh, which yeah. would be really interesting. We'll get to see the kind of almost human side to Thanos in a very weird way. Um, and second of all, I have to ask Joel, since he uh, loves Spider-Man Homecoming as his favorite in the MCU so far, do you like the look of the Iron Spider suit? Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Uh, it's a little busy, but it's it's fun. Uh, very, I, I like the uh, the upgrades for sure. Cool. All right, so our next trailer is my favorite trailer of the week. I'm just going to give it uh, away now. <laughs> Uh, this is the new film from A24. It's called Eighth Grade, and guys, I'm just gonna make a prediction now. Uh, you know, Moonlight, a coming of age story, uh, was my number one film of 2016. Lady Bird, a coming of age story, was my favorite film of 2017. So, I'm just saying, I'm not deciding now, but I'm just saying that if Eighth Grade is my number one film of this year, don't be completely surprised. You do realize um, that would be A24 three years in a row, right? That would that would, that would would mean that they are the greatest company <laughs> in his, the history of movie making. Um, and it's honestly, it's entirely possible because of the fact that they get behind so many movies that are my cup of tea. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it would be, it would be significant um, if, if that happened. I, I really hope it is, it, it is something that happens. Uh, but yeah, so this one is about a young girl who she's in eighth grade. She's obviously, um, she is a YouTube personality. She does a lot of videos online. She does Instagram stuff. Um, I don't know if she does vines cause I don't know if this is set after vine was shut down, but <laughs> in any case, you know, she does that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, probably Snapchats, you know, she's an internet presence basically, but she's also a kid. She's also in school. She also has all of the eighth grade troubles. Uh, eighth grade is quite the year. And, um, you know, you got this great new, well, not new talent, but you get this great kind of breakthrough talent with Elsie Fisher, who, who voiced the, it's so fluffy. I'm going to die girl from the despicable me movies. Oh, God. Um, yeah, uh, forgot her name in the movie, but anyway, um, yeah, so <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see her jump from that to this. Um, I just – I love this. I, I, I just – it's exactly what I love about – you know, with movies can can nail the coming-of-age tropes, I'm just I'm, – I'm a huge fan of that when that happens. And it just looks so charming in every way. I, I've been hearing great things since Sundance. And uh, yeah, I can't wait. I, it just everything about this trailer hit for me. It just – you know, there's going to be elements here where we all can relate. You know, it doesn't matter about the gender. It's, um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, Chase and I both have, you know, eighth grade memories and probably not very good ones. Probably some good ones, but probably not very good ones either. Yeah, Chase is vehemently shaking his head right now. Um, it's a it's an interesting year. My, my worst year was ninth grade, personally, but 
uh, eighth grade was definitely uh, eventful. <laughs> so I'm excited for this. This is my favorite trailer of the week. It comes from Bo Burnham, who was a YouTube guy himself back in the day. Um, and I actually I followed some of his vid- videos back in the day. So this is it's going to be interesting to see him kind of come into the big the big time with his directorial feature debut. And uh, so I'm I'm excited, really, really excited for this. Yeah, it's uh, just full disclosure. I love Bill Burnham's stand up. Uh, he's uh, one of the funnier presence presences on a stage. Uh, he's got so much energy while not having energy at all because he's one <laughs> of these comics that plays the um, kind of like straight laced comic uh, on stage where he like he'll say a joke and then he'll say the punchline and he doesn't like. Um, he's very dry. He's very he's, dry. He's very, he's very, he's very dry yeah, in his humor. Yeah, very straight, dry uh, type of he's, delivery. He, he has he has been that way since his YouTube days. I haven't watched much, much of his stand up. I, I need to do that, but kind of lost you know track of him. But uh, definitely back in the YouTube days, I, I watched a few of a few of his videos because I was getting into a lot of YouTube stuff, and I was going to be a YouTube guy myself, but never did it. And um, hey, well, kinda, now you are. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're, a YouTube, YouTube. you're a YouTube person. Um, yeah. No, uh, this trailer was great. It was it was uh, warm, funny. Um, it really captures that essence because eighth grade is an interesting year because it bridges that gap between uh, childlike innocence to almost adulthood in high school. So you're yeah. like on the cusp of transforming into that person, and that's going to deal with a lot of emotions, not really knowing what to do, being scared about growing up and you are you are directly in the most awkward phase yes. <laughs> of of pubescence. Like that's puberty hits you hard in eighth grade. Um, yes, it does. I mean it's it's crazy. It's like a huge, huge, uh huge shift. And I know that Elsie Fisher's just barely older than than her character. So correct. She she clearly I think she's in ninth grade or mm-hmm. something. She you know, she's like a, a year a year removed from this. So uh, she's obviously going to be pulling from a lot of very recent memories to play this role, which is brilliant. Yeah. That they didn't get like somebody who's you know 16 but passes for 13, <laughs> whatever. You know, which they could have done. They could have. Um, yeah. yeah, they they got somebody. I'm gonna look up her age right now, actually, because I know that it's fairly close. Yeah. Elsie uh, Fisher. Let's see. Yeah, she's 14. Okay, so perfect. she's 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 clearly just past eighth grade. And so she'll she'll clearly be able to, you know, uh, draw from a lot of memories that way. And uh, anyway, well, so I'm I'm well, I'm excited. Yeah, it's uh, I know it's Joel's favorite trailer of the week. Uh, obviously, I gotta you know, pop my uh, uh, nerd boner for <laughs> Avengers: Infinity War. But I will say that uh, um, I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be Joel's Lady Bird of this year for sure. Yeah, uh, and. With Joel, if it if it isn't, I will be absolutely stunned. It comes out on July thirteenth, so you know that we're going to be talking about this, or I'm going to be talking about this at least on this show. Yeah, we're so. we're going to get an invite to it. I mean, it's a twenty four. It's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, just full disclosure, uh, if you guys want to know, kind of like what my anticipated a twenty four, possibly my number one movie of the year at the end of the year, Joel's is eighth grade. I'm actually banking on Hereditary. Like I cannot wait yeah. for that one because that that's one, more that's that more up my awesome. alley. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's my A twenty four pick for my most anticipated. But uh, yeah, the A three trailer was great. Um, also, another great trailer, uh, probably my least favorite, but I still like it. Is uh, Adrift, and this one stars Sam Claflin and uh, Shailene Woodley. They are a couple go out to sea. Storms happen. Something happens. They are stranded. It's a survival movie. Uh, really, nothing more to it. I didn't read. Uh, the book it's based off of. Um, so there might be some twists and turns in it, but for the trailer's sake, uh, on its surface, it's a standard survival movie. There's nothing wrong with that. The acting looks strong. Uh, the sense of endangerment is raw, uh, you know, raw and kind of in your face. So I like it. It's not like, you know, a trailer go, whoop de doo But, uh, you know, for right now, <laughs> I think it's important that Shailene Woodley does, just keeps making more movies because I think she's really talented. Um, I love the spectacular now. I love uh, Big Little uh, Little Little Lies that she was earlier in uh, last year. Sam Claflin, I haven't really seen much of uh, because I only know him as the guy from Hunger Games. So uh, I want to see him in uh, more stuff. And I think uh, when you do survival movies like this, uh, just like with the All Is Lost movie recently with Robert Redford, these are intimate movies. They are 
literally just the actors out in the ocean. So you have to bring your best performance possible to make the audience hooked the entire time. And so I want to see Sam kind of reach that level because I haven't seen it yet. But as far as Shailene Woodley, uh, she is uh, one of the best up-and-coming actresses. Please get that divergent stench off of your record and start uh, fresh. The trailer looks uh, pretty solid. So uh, I know we haven't really discussed this one yet. Right, yeah. It it came out kind of a couple weeks ago, actually. It was, it's was it been floating around the theaters for a while. Floating around. Um, uh, oh, my God. I did not your mean, your I did puns not, are just on fire today. <laughs> I did not intend that, I swear. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's sort of like my least favorite, but it, it, just because there's so many other good trailers. It's a good trailer. It's It looks like a really solid survival drama um, between two people this time. You know, it comes from the director of Everest. Um, Baltazar, uh, Baltazar Kormakur, uh, who, you know, he also did a couple, he did a couple of, um, action movies with contraband and two guns. He comes from, uh, he's an Icelandic director and all of that, but he did Everest. So he kind of has this survival movie thing down. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, certainly he, there's a lot of showmanship here and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be loan reviewing that one on, um, on that weekend. So I'm looking forward to it. It's the first weekend of June. So yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. one of those ones you can't really talk about. Cause like I said, unfortunately with the survival type of genre out in the middle of the ocean, there's not really much to discuss cause it's typically the same stuff. Um, but the interesting twist to this one in the trailer is that Sam Claflin kind of gets off the ship, gets back on it somehow. And, you don't know like who is like incapable of doing what. So I don't want to ruin it if you want to keep it, you know, uh, to yourself, but you know, solid trailer around. And now this next one, I had no idea what the hell it was about. <laughs> I knew it uh, premiered at South by Southwest and a lot of people were raving about it. And you know, it stars, um, my man, Lakeith Stanfield. Uh, I think he is a very underrated actor that a lot of people should, um, start to watch a lot more of his movies. Cause I didn't really care for Crown Heights last year, but he led that movie, and that was his first lead movie that I recall, and uh, he did a really great job in a very average movie, but he was really great. Of course, he was in Get Out. He was also at the Oscars doing his Get Out character, which was really funny. Um, he's just a, a, a likable presence on anything he does. I know he's on Atlanta right now, the FX show. So, this one is uh, also starring Tessa Thompson uh, and Army Hammer. Just to name a few, even Patton Oswalt's in this. So get this. I'm going to read it straight from the IMDb synopsis because it's just hilarious when uh, you read it. In an alternate present-day version of Oakland, a telemarketer uh, named Cassius Green discovers a magical key to professional success, <laughs> propelling him into a macabre, a macabre, uh, macabre uh, universe. What? Uh, and when you watch the trailer, it completely has that kind of like quirky sci- science fiction quality to it. Um, so when the trailer starts out, it's very kind of very average where it's like, okay, we have this guy, he lives in a garage, he's not making enough money, he needs to find a job. And so someone suggests to him to do telemarketing. And so he goes to the telemarketing uh, job and you're like, okay, it's going to be him trying to figure out the job and getting uh, acquainted with its activities. And then we have Danny Glover next to him going, no, 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 you need to use your white man voice. And he's like, what are you talking about? And then for obvious comedic uh, effect, they have this ADR white man voice that they portray, and it's absolutely hilarious on how they uh, do that. Do you to know call... who? Do you know who that is, by the way? No, I didn't. Look, uh, I didn't look it up. It's David Cross. <laughs> it's David Cross. Right? That's that's perfect. David Cross it's has perfect. The, he has like he has the, the perfect white, white person, person, person voice. I know, yes. perfect white person voice. But <laughs> so uh, it's obvious ADR for comedic effect, and then. When uh, uh, Cassius realizes that voice works, uh, he moves up the chain. It gets weirder as he goes. I am into like the weird kind of um, uh, alternative movies where like I don't think they would play well with most people, but I love searching out for weird movies. This is so up my alley. It looks funny. It looks unique. It looks like something I've never seen before. I am so down with this. Oh, so uh, same here. Uh, so I was just listening because I'm a an, um, regular listener of Eric Cohn and Ann Thompson's uh, IndieWire podcast. They're the um, Screen Talk, Screen Talk. 
uh, great podcast. And, you know, I, I was kind of catching up because I've been behind a few weeks, but they, but Eric Cohn saw this at Sundance and uh, was raving about it, said that it's just this wacky satire <laughs> and it takes the, you know, sort of this, um, the office space fight club kind of <laughs> wanted kind of office, like boring office life uh, stuff to a totally fresh angle. And that's great. I, I just, I think that that's so, uh, that's so important because we need, you know, we know every story at this point. There's no, there's no original stories anymore. And, you know, obviously we've seen office satires, but we haven't really seen one quite like this. And I, I just, I can't wait. Comes out, um, when does this one come out? It's in the summer, I know, but I don't, I don't know if they have, they have the release date. It's, uh, it's, it's like a couple weeks from eighth grade, actually. It's like they're relatively close to each other. Let's see. Sorry to bother you. Um, uh, July 6th. Wow. So a week early. Oh, there a week you go. Earlier. Yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, two, two really terrific looking um, uh, Sundance darlings from like right in a row. It's, uh, it's awesome. And I, I just I'm, – I'm looking at the uh, – oh, 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 okay. So Steve Buscemi <laughs> – <laughs> Steve Buscemi is the Danny Glover character's white voice. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. Patton Oswalt is the uh, Omari Hardwick character's white voice, and then now we have David Cross. So <laughs> they literally went to these people and said, "Hey, could you be the white voices in our movie?" <laughs> anyway, oh, great God. stuff. Looks really like clever and sharp and. Uh, Lakeith Stanfield looks awesome, and uh, yeah, I I just can't wait. Terry Crews, we see Stephen yeah, Yeun, <laughs> Stephen Yeun, uh, Tessa Thompson, uh, uh, obviously Danny Glover, um, Army Hammer as apparently a corporate like mogul who wants to take over the world, which is really <laughs> interesting. So I I can't wait. Looks like it's going in about seventy billion different directions. It comes from Boots Riley. Um, and, uh, he's a rapper. He's now making his, you know, direct, his directorial debut, I think, right? Or his yes. feature directorial debut. And, um, and yeah, I just, I can't wait. So like, it, my, my, stuff. my thing is if you set yourself up in this wacky universe, commit to it, make it yes. as wacky as hell and yes. just, just Add, commit to the idea. <laughs> commit to it. And part of the commission, committing to it is adding crazy things after another. Like exactly. <laughs> Just this apparently isn't. Yeah. This apparently isn't just an office satire. It's about him trying to like pre- prevent a guy from taking over the world. I mean, <laughs> it's it's so silly and completely right. I just, especially corporate mogul. Yeah. You know, as a, as an office worker, it's like the upper guy. You know, it's 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 just great, really funny, and uh, so anyway. But yeah, it's actually kind of hard between this and eighth grade as my favorite trailer. I know you're going with. Uh, with your your uh, your favorite thing in the entire world, but I'm I'm going with eighth grade just because it's so down my alley. So if, if I had to pick a close second, it's uh it's sorry to bother you because that's totally okay. up my my weird alley that I love exploring. All, so all really good trailers. Yeah, week. good trailer week. I, yeah. I'm actually uh, really impressed. And that speaking... our that our least favorite has to be a drift <laughs> it, when it looks like a really solid yeah, just... survival story. I mean, it's. It's got to be a good week. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm really uh, impressed. I mean, you had a couple of blockbusters, a couple of smaller films, good stuff, and just you know, kind of uh, uh, bleeding into the movies. Now we're going to talk about a really great one. Uh, I'm going to just spoil it because uh, I think this pretty this movie is pretty much flawless except for one thing. But um, let's review Love Simon. This is the uh, you know new film from 20th Century Fox. Uh, stars Nick Robinson, and you know, you know, I'm always terrible at this. So, uh, Joel, what do we got? Who's in this? What's this about? What's going on over there? Yeah, so this is the new movie from director Greg Berlanti, who is most popular for having created a lot of uh, TV shows for uh, teens. You know, whether they be coming of age shows like Everwood or superhero shows like Arrow, he's behind a lot of this stuff. And um, he previously directed. Uh, this is actually kind of a reunion with him and Josh Duhamel who plays um, a supporting character in this movie, um, he previously directed the completely awful Life as We Know It from back in 2010. Uh, This is a big, big, big improvement on that. Um, So this one is about Simon, played, you know, as you said, by Nick Robinson. Uh, He is a... uh, I actually don't know what year he's in. Is he a junior? 
Yeah, it's either junior or senior year. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure it's one of the latter years. I think that he's 16 or 17. Anyway, um, he's in one of the latter years of high school, and you know he's got a normal life. He has a nice, you know, family. Uh, he has good friends. They hang out a lot. Um, you know, two lifelong friends. One who's kind of uh, joined the group recently, but feels like a lifelong friend. And then he also has a secret: the fact that he is gay. He has not told anybody including his closest friends, and um, it kind of eats him up a bit. Um, until one day, a student comes out anonymously on a, um, on a blog, on a school blog, and uh, identifies himself only as blue, and Simon decides to start a correspondence with this person, and uh, comes out to them as well, and uh, then a blackmail scheme starts uh, when... It is found out because of, um, you know, somebody just kind of finding finding some information and using it, um, and that's actually the one the one hang up, uh, <laughs> the character that is the blackmailer for me. But I'll, I'll get into that later on, um, or I guess I'll get into that like first because we're going to be doing negative negative thoughts first. But um, yeah, so I was I had no idea what this movie was about. I was not aware of the book, which is called Simon. Versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. What a great title! Um, and uh, I was not aware of the book. I, you know, there's only so much pop culture that you can keep up with at one time. <laughs> so I apologize to everybody else uh, who who is a fan. I was not aware of this. Had not seen a trailer because it was one of those that fell through the cracks in December when it came out. We had a bunch to talk about in January, and I was just kind of looking through, but I didn't watch the trailer for this. And so I wasn't aware of it. I, I, I didn't know what it was about until I was, I think, like the day of. I, I uh, Somebody had mentioned to me that this was the first wide release featuring a gay teenage romantic lead uh, in history as, as far as he can remember, which is insane. Um, and that's when I found out that it was about a gay person, but I didn't know anything else about it. So this is literally one of those that came out of nowhere for me. And I kind of loved it, so um, I'll I'll hand it over to Chase for his anticipation. I I don't even know if he had any, but uh, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. no, I it was one of those things to where I did see the trailer and I I thought it looked uh, like a really great coming of age film. And I'm going to say this right now, just so uh, we can get it out of the way, because I said the same thing when we did Black Panther. Um, Joel and I are, are, are two straight men, so we obviously don't know how difficult it is for people to come out, um, and we realize that it, it is important to do it on your own terms and you know come out to the people that you want to know and stuff. We realize that that's an important transition in someone's life. We ha- we don't understand that because we we will not go through with that ever, and so I just want people to know that like we understand. You know how important this movie is uh, to uh, tell people of you know that community that it is okay to be yourself and come out and uh, embrace it because there are going to be a lot more people that love you than hate you. And so I just wanted to say that really clear before we uh, continue onward. Uh, but I love the trailer, and so Joel and I we saw this um, you know Al- like almost a month ago. <laughs> yeah, almost a month ago, and I do believe that that kind of hindered the. Uh, box office results a little bit just because they 20th century fox had four promo screenings for this four that's too much um and too yeah. too much to a point where everyone that wanted to see it already saw it so where's yeah. money go? and <laughs> that's that's kind of my issue we'll get to the box office results in a little bit but uh, as far as like not the movie goes just on a, a marketing perspective d- don't ever do that to any movie um have one promo screening get the hype up and then let people uh, go and so yes <laughs> Joel is correct we saw this a month ago and I as soon as it was over with uh, we looked at each other and we're like this was fantastic I cannot wait to talk about this I mean, so we had to sit uh, on our asses for a month uh, and now we're finally here I think this is a pretty much perfect film except for one major hang up uh, which I guess we'll get to right now with the negatives um, it's pretty much the same for both of us but I'll go ahead and start yeah. off and Joel will go into more elaboration because uh, my my vocabulary only goes beyond eight words. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. The bullies in the film. Now, obviously, when you have a film like this, you're going to have bullies that make fun of anyone that is gay 
or lesbian or transgender, and they're going to have it, you know, kind of poised up to what real life would be like. I understand that. So we have two different types of bullies in this film, and one is, or two of them are on like a very cartoony level, and then one is like on such a like devastating, like illegal level that it just doesn't mesh well because when we get to that point in the movie, it's just, oh, I talked to this person. We cool now, fam, and then we're moving on. It's like, no, 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 uh-uh. They did some pretty bad stuff. Like, we need to, you know, go uh, uh, give them a citation or something. Like, just anything. But that's kind of my my only issue with this movie. I think it's uh, pretty much flawless, uh, except for that, to where I don't think uh, Berlanti knew how to portray the villains uh, in a balanced manner or make it more realistic like everyone else in the movie in terms of characters. Like I said... Two of the bullies in the school were uh, cartoony, and they did stuff that a 10-year-old would do, not a 17-year-old. And I've been in, Joel and I both, uh, we we have come across a-holes in our life, and I I know how bullies function. They're not that childish. Uh, Some of them might be, but they would never go to the lengths that these two did, and so that didn't really work out. And of course, uh, there's a uh, confrontation at the end where the vice principal's like, okay, say you're sorry, and they're like, oh, we're sorry, and it's like... (sighs) But they're kind of dicks, you know? It's like you want them to get their, I don't know, just detention or something, but whatever. Um, and then the other one that uh, Joel was referring to, Martin. This guy it does some straight-up illegal stuff. We're like borderline sociopathic like tendencies, and all that happens was there's a conversation at the end, and then it's kind of just dropped. And it's like... No, uh, this guy decided to go this route with his character. Do something with that. It's just like, I don't know. And so it didn't really work out. I thought the the bullies portrayed in this were not balanced in a more realistic tone like everyone else. It was either too cartoony or too severe to a point where they didn't really do anything about it. And they were just kind of left by the wayside. That is seriously my only issue with the movie. Yeah, so... um... It was weird because I I texted Chase uh, after I watched his video review. Since I had seen it with him, I, I felt comfortable to do that. Um, and we were we were joint reviewing it for Dallas Movie Screenings. You can go uh, look at that now. Um, and I and I said that our problems were the same. I actually forgot about the bullies that you were talking about because I feel like they were such a. Um, so minor. They were they were so, so they were so minor. Yeah, yeah, they were so peripheral. Uh, but you're right. They were a little cartoonish. Uh, but my major problem was is with Martin to the point that I decided in my written review that I wouldn't name him because it felt like uh, it would be kind of rubbing salt in some wounds. The thing is that this character doesn't just do this sociopathic stuff out of self interest. He's trying to, um, you know, get. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it, you know, nicely. He's trying to get in the good graces of uh, the one of one of Simon's girlfriends and uh, his his friends, who's a girl. And uh, he he does this blackmail scheme, and it's pretty cruel, and it actually causes like this spider web of consequences uh, where you know. His behavior causes Simon to kind of behave abnormally a bit, um, sometimes rather desperately in ways that hurt other people, won't give away anything. But, um, you know, it, it just felt like he was a device. He's a device to show how, uh, you know, following a coming out experience like this one, um, you know, pe- people do callow and cruel things because they can. Um, which is a great point. Uh, I think that the character is – there's too much focus put on him in some way that he just becomes a device. And so that's – I didn't I didn't like that, but you're right. I mean it's it's also such a minor problem because it makes up – makes it up with everything else here. So yeah. it's – it's um, yeah, that's that's my issue. I think that – I think that maybe they could have given him less screen time and it would have been less of, less of a problem. But he factors in a lot to this movie and it's a little too much it's, it's actually um, way more than because when it started yeah, he, out he like, has more he has more screen time than his than, friends do simon's friends well one at least one of his friends yes. nick 
uh, he has more screen time than Nick does, and Nick is one of his best friends, and we're supposed to, you know, um, you know, it's just, it just it just definitely seems very weird. Um, yeah. So that's my one problem. Uh, I really don't have any problems with like production values in this movie. It's very sleek and um, and all that, and I'll get to, I'll get into that later. It's solid filmmaking. Um, you know, you you run a you run across a lot of you know cheap looks, cheap looking coming of age movies if they don't really pay attention to the filmmaking. But I actually thought that this looked very sleek and very um crisp and so i'm surprised but that's my only problem and that includes anything in filmmaking so uh, i'm gonna hand it over to you for your positives i know that you only have maybe two right so <laughs> yeah, j- 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 just one uh uh you know i have a a really just kind of disdain for the title there's no period after that like what is it love simon period like it does it does it's not clear joel no i'm just kidding um no uh everything else uh now joel is correct the filmmaking and the crisp look to it, you know, it looks clean, it looks nice. Uh, the school is portrayed well uh, in the way it's designed, the houses and stuff. And that's only on, like, a good level. What really elevates this movie are the performances and the writing, where it just it feels like a classic coming-of-age tale that's going to have a modern twist to it with, you know, uh, being represented in the LBGTQ community. And so that's where kind of the heart of the matter is is that we've seen these coming of age films before we've seen high schoolers struggle with who they are and who they want to be but we've never seen it told from this perspective and i think on a big blockbuster from a major studio level it hits it in spades what director greg berlanti who is a gay man himself what he has brought to this movie was you know, a sense of realness and, you know, stuff that he has gone through as well with probably him coming out, you know, applying it to the uh, Nick Robinson and everyone else in this movie and really making it seem like these are real characters and, you know, real situations that you would see people from this community go through. And on top of all that, it was way funnier than I thought it would be. It was charming. It was heartwarming. You felt everything from these characters, whether it be from, you know, uh, Nick Robinson trying to explain to his uh, one of his best friends that he's gay or explain to his parents that he's gay like every single moment in this movie had a, a purpose and reasoning to it and uh, it was just a nice uh, just warm tale about someone trying to find their voice to come out and making sure they're uh, uh, they do it in the best way possible but unfortunately <laughs> Martin just screws everything up but you know uh, I just I love it. Everyone was charming, just likable, in some cases even lovable to a point where I was like, I just want to be these people's friends. And um, I will say one of the biggest things I really appreciate about this movie from director Greg Berlanti's standpoint, every single actor has their moment. Every mm-hmm. single one of them. Uh, main even character. even the guy playing Martin. Yeah, even is, Martin has a. a he's re- good. He's yes. good in the role. It's the role I have a problem with, yeah. but it's it, his performance is good. Yeah, every everyone, single actor here works. Yeah. Everyone, even even Josh Duhamel and Jennifer yeah. Gardner, the parents have yes. their moment, and I and would the even, sister, and the even sister, the sister. Yeah, I would Talitha even Bayman. argue that uh, uh, Jennifer Gardner has probably the best speech in the entire movie. That really represents <laughs> the the uh, kind of release, if you will, of having that weight lifted off your shoulders and coming out and feeling like yourself instead of feeling like you're repressed all the time. And like, I just, I felt like her poignant little monologue was, she, she gets a Michael Stuhlbarg moment. Yeah. It, uh, like, it's important for not only the character, but for the audience as well. And I just, there was something really touching about that. And even with Josh Duhamel, who is labeled in this movie as a, a conservative figure where, you know, he, Seems like he's okay with maybe having a gay son, but if it were to come out to him, he he doesn't know how you react to it. And even him at the end, you kind of feel like he's he's trying, and that's what's important for that type of character. Is that he, as long as we see that he's trying, it's like that's perfect. It's like he went through the the correct um, you know twist and turns where like you find out he's gay kind of goes off, silences himself for a little bit, and then kind of comes out and be like, son, I just, I love you. You know, I just don't know how to react. Like, it's stuff like that that, you know, makes it worthwhile. And also, 
there was a surprising element to this movie. There's a kind of mystery component to it where, like, you know, what Joel said with the whole blue thing, mm. it's like you don't know who yeah. that is. And they pro- they provide an extra genre layer to it where it's like it's not just a comedy and a drama and coming of age. It's also a, a mystery. It's cool. Um, and it works. And so – oh, and also I guess uh, one last thing to top it off. Definitely, 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 definitely. Uh, my favorite Nick Robinson performance he's having he's have uh, in his career so far. Um, I first saw him in that sitcom with uh, Joey Lawrence and Melissa Joe Hart, where he plays like that. That oh, he was in that. Yeah, he was the older. Brother. I did not. I did not know that. I never watched that. So I okay. I, it, uh... was, it was not that good. But uh, right, right. Uh, that's <laughs> where I saw Nick Robinson for the first time. I've never seen uh, the Kings of Summer. Uh, I did see Jurassic World and. It's whatever. Yeah, um, that's it's it's not about acting. He yeah, he was not, just in it. Yeah, just in it. But <laughs> as far as like him advancing his career, this, this was the right yeah. move for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know how much more I can say. Um, and I guess if I had to attribute the funniest person in this movie, <laughs> uh, Joel, do you remember the uh, uh, the drama teacher? Hilarious. I love. Oh her. yeah. Oh I my gosh. <laughs> and even she has her moment at the end too, where she's like, "Get your yeah, ass off she... that table." <laughs> Yeah, she suddenly, you know, she becomes the teacher. She's yeah. she's not just like this funny teacher. She's she's a teacher. She yeah. she knows how to command a room. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll go ahead and get into mine. And you know, you were talking, and you're right. You and I don't know what it's like to come out. Um, on an experiential level, we don't have that experience. Obviously, experiential. Um, however, I think that that this movie makes it. Uh, or you know helps it be rather easy to grasp the difficulties of coming out because everything's got to be right you know you you you, you can imagine it is everything's got to be right the person to tell the moment to tell it the courage to tell it um the, you know this part of you that you've come to understand about your hormones and all of that how that works and um you know all of the extenuating circumstances leading up to that moment have to be perfect and it seems like uh, one of the points that this movie makes kind of in an inherent way is that it, there's probably no perfect moment that because of the law of averages, it has to go wrong. And if it goes right, then that's the exception. That's not the rule. You know, obviously there are people where everything goes right for them, but because of how the world works, because of stupid idiots who, um, you know, feel the need to, uh, target these people for, the you know people they love or how they love it's it's you know it's just gonna be dramatic it's not going to be perfect and here you know i, I don't want to I, I don't want to get into spoilers but here the first time he ever says it to someone is at a stop sign and it's not the person that he ever thought he would tell because of the fact that it, it's <laughs> Again, I don't want to get I don't want to really get into spoilers, but it's the the friend who's been the friend in the friend group for the shortest amount of time. And so that's clearly not the person that he's that he expects to tell, but he does. And then later on when he's telling people, he's he really isn't making the choice to tell them. He's doing under he's doing it under duress. And it's it's he's obviously making the choice. It is his choice to do it, but he's choosing to do it because he has no other choice and so that's one of the really moving things about this movie is the fact that it's about the entire process of coming out the building up to it the actual moment and then the and then what happens in the wake of that and we get to see that in such an honest and fresh way uh and very accessible to the mainstream audience i i'm Sad to hear that it's apparently not doing well at the box office. I don't know the numbers, but I'm I'm sad to hear that. Um, but you know, kids need this. There was there was a there was an article, and it's a bunch of hogwash. Um, I, I it might have been written by a gay person. I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but the premise of it was still weird to me. It was like do ki- do do today's do sorry <laughs> can't speak. Do today's kids need this movie? And you hear about like the actor who plays Nick, by the way, being in this movie gave him the courage to come out. I don't know if you heard about that. I thought but, I thought it was his brother that came out. No, 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 no. Uh, the the actor, I think the actor who played Nick, the friend. 
Oh, I think, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think he, I know yes, that yes. I know that it was it was Nick Robinson's brother. I'm pretty sure did yes. come out during. Yeah, it just happened to like be during the the period when he was making the movie. But I'm pretty sure the actor who plays Nick, his friend, uh, the Nick Robinson character's friend, is um, has come out now as a result of this movie, and it was the making of this movie that helped him do that. And so, and then you have like um, there was this tweet where. Um, uh, oh no, it was a letterboxed review where somebody like posted a review, uh, and then said, oh yeah, so I came out to my parents today, you know, after seeing the movie, it gave, it gave her the strength to do that. And, you know, it, it's just like, of course kids need this movie. I know that it's, you know, it's very, it's very studio. So of course it's a white male coming out. And so we don't have the entire queer experience, if you will, but it's such a it's such a groundbreaking movie in the fact that it's even you know a wide release about somebody who's gay coming out treating it as just you know a romantic lead not not as anything different and because it isn't and it doesn't need to be treated as different but you get this feeling that you know gay people are treated either either as jokes or as sidekicks or as token friends or whatever and here it's the main character, and um, I keep mentioning Mark in our <laughs> in our thing, but his first re- sentence is, "Love Simon feels revolutionary," uh, of, of his review because of that fact. It feels like there's a major turning point happening. So to get back to the movie, um, I think that that's what this movie's about. It's it's about the whole process of coming out, and here it does wrap it into a a mystery, which is intriguing, by the way, because you're constantly wondering who this is. You want him to find this person to be happy, and so there's stakes involved in the mystery. And it's also just interesting because of how secretive that person is. You know, his um, uh, Simon's ability to kind of uh, figure out who it is and all that. It's it's very it's very interesting. It's it's good fuel for a drama, and uh, I really like that. But it's also very funny, like you said. It's very much a high school comedy, and it mixes the two into something really special. And so I, th- I think that that's my favorite thing about this movie. But another thing, Nick Robinson's performance in this is really special. I, I, I think that if – like if – honestly, I, I don't know if I'd put it on this caliber, but Saoirse Ronan and Lady Bird, if she can be nominated for that performance, he should be able to be nominated for this one. It's probably not going to happen because it came out so early in the year. But then again, we had Get Out. So hopefully this kind of comes back around. I, I really hope – that what Fox does is, you know, th- th- that they bring this movie back around at the end of the year to be in consideration, at least for critics' awards, to kind of put it on the map because it's it's one that deserves that. Um, so uh, Nick Robinson, great performance. He he does such subtle work. He's there's a lot put on his shoulders as an actor in this movie. There's so much subtlety and nuance to his performance, and he's working with. Uh, it's not exactly it's not exactly subtle material, so the fact that he's able to take a, a, a nuanced approach to this role is uh, great. You know, it's it's a very it's a very straightforward, blunt tale of coming out, but he is able to internalize a lot, and then when he lets it out, it's deserved angst. You know, it's not like just angst for the angst for the for the um, virtue of having angst in your movie, and it's just so it's just so special he's great in this movie um like you said all of the actors work the friends are all great um even martin's great you know you get um uh keenan lonsdale plays uh, a character in this named uh bram <laughs> uh i'll just say that uh he's really good in his in his role uh the drama teacher's great tony hale's a lot of fun as the principal who tries to be the kid's friend even though he has to be like the you know figure. the authority, and he and he takes their phones away from them. You know he's, it's very much a. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a private school. Um, I got that. I got that feeling. At least I'm pretty sure it's a religious school. So, you know he has this. He has to be the the authority, but he wants to be their friend. So he takes on the lingo while stealing their phones to keep for the rest of the day. It's just really funny. He plays it just perfectly. That it isn't a joke. That it isn't a joke role. It's a genuine. He he's he even gets his moment and. It's um, it's it's great. So, uh, 
Yeah, I, I just I love the cast and then the parents. Uh, Jennifer Garner needs to be nominated for Best Supporting Actress. She's she's amazing here, especially in that moment um, where she gets her Michael Stuhlbarg moment and she encapsulates in one line of dialogue. Um, it's called it, it involves breath. You know what I'm talking about? Where it seems like she basically encapsulates the entire process of bottling up that feeling at least how it how it seems from afar from a third person perspective or second person perspective whatever um of you know kind of being around a person who keep who is bottling up these feelings um that, that is that is exactly how it feels and chase knows what i'm think what i'm talking about um uh, it's such a perfect encapsulation of that and uh she's great it's a great scene um I love the dynamic of the parents where he basically the, – the father played by Josh Duhamel kind of makes these like casually homophobic jokes in a way that is clear that he doesn't mean any of it. It's just he's making jokes because he's a jokester. And then the mom is this proudly liberal person who doesn't believe in sheltering her kids from anything for any reason. And I love that dynamic because it's – they're so, they're so like different from each other but also – completely in love and you buy them as a couple they get their little moment um you know a couple little moments where they sell it as a married couple and i and i love that um and so anyway just all the actors great talitha bateman as, as the sister has a great moment I, I just i just love the acting in this movie it's it's such a such a beautifully performed movie and you know like i was saying it's this crisp clean production it doesn't look like a tv show um it looks like it's cinematic but it isn't like some loudly cinematic thing it's it looks crisp and clean and well produced um not like life as we know it uh, which look i don't know if chase saw it but it looks like crap it, it just is everything is overexposed and he clearly learned his lesson um you know coming into this one so very happy that it's him directing this movie by the way uh, it very much feels like something that he would have gotten behind if it was a TV show, um, and uh, really, really solid, solid filmmaking. So, I just, I just am such a big fan of this. It's so, so good. And you know, I, I kind of hinted a couple weeks ago if this will have to be a really good year for this to not be on my top ten. And it's because I gravitate toward coming of age tales, and that's what this is. He's he's coming of age and coming out. Um. Coming out of age. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I tried. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, great movie. Everybody needs to go see this. Please, please, please. I'm really hopeful that it's pushed into a bit of a, a better second week, even if it drops, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm hoping that it just drops a little in the second week because apparently it didn't do well in the first weekend. I, I don't know. Um, but I really hope that kind of the word of mouth gets attached and people see this so please check this out i'm giving it an a minus uh just because of that martin subplot i can't quite go with an a i know that um <laughs> that chase is going with an a i can tell already but uh i'm going with an a minus which is strong y'all know how i grade and that's that's fairly high so um yeah a minus for for love simon yeah uh joel's right solid day for me i would i would honestly give it that a plus if you know the bullies were handled better, and right. more more focus was if, on the more appropriate characters. But if they if they completely excised the two bozos and then gave Martin either less screen time or a bit of a more human like development, human meaning you know seeming like a human being, <laughs> then I think that this movie would be solid A. I I I, I just have those two kind of hang ups, and the rest of it's aces. So, yeah, and, and I. I I will say this on air. This is recorded, so you can take it to the grave. <laughs> this film, on a blockbuster level, is groundbreaking. Just how I felt like Moonlight for an independent film level was groundbreaking. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I'm hoping that more people see this. And when we get to the box office numbers, it is devastating. And it makes me angry that Fox had four promo screenings for four weeks in a row. Of course everyone already saw it. So it's just... <laughs> it's frustrating dude and when i get to the number like more people should see it but hopefully the second week drop off is minimal all right 
So moving on into good old Tomb Raider, which uh, I obviously didn't see because uh, I have better things to do. Um, (laughs) Yes, you do. (laughs) I do. So, um, you know, Joel's going to get on to that one. Hopefully it's not a big review where he's going to take too much time. But, Joel, you saw uh, you saw Tomb Raider, uh, the 2017 version with Alicia Vikander. Um, Go for it. Yeah, so basically the only interesting thing about this movie going into it was the fact that after supporting actress winner uh, Angelina Jolie played the role back in 2001 and 3, um, then now you have supporting actress winner Alicia Vikander. So two supporting actress winners uh, where their kind of their first big role where they became a, a household name was by winning the Oscar in both cases, really. Um, and now you have this. Um yeah, this one isn't as fun as the others, though. Uh, I, I like the dopey quality of the first two. Uh, they're not great movies, but, um, you know, and Joe Lee was kind of a bland action star for me, but yeah, they're, they're fun. Uh, this one isn't as much fun. So the story here is that Lara Croft, played by Alicia Vikander, um, has, it, has basically... Her father's disappeared. Her father's played by Dominic West, and he's gone off to try to find or to investigate an ancient curse in an island off the coast of Japan. Uh, so she goes to Japan after him, after um, finally, you know, trying to get the wealth that she has inherited from his supposed death. And um, he left clues for her to try to find him. Uh, because he's gone off and you know he's tried to find this curse, reported dead. Uh, whether or not that's true is completely obvious, but I guess I won't spoil it. Um, and uh, then she comes up against a villain named Matthias Vogel, played by Walton Goggins, who is trying to, I guess, release the curse on the population. I'm actually not entirely sure what his goal is, because <laughs> literally he never says what his goal is, and it's never clear. Um, perfect. Yeah, it's perfect, right? Yeah, the the villain is obviously the weakest thing about this, including Walton Goggins, who isn't very good. He he isn't committing to this role very much. Um, he he actually looks bored. Like he just walks around. It's like he filmed all of his stuff over the course of a weekend or something. I don't know. Uh, in any case, it's not a very good movie, but it's also not an awful movie. It's not annoying in any way or or anything. And in fact, it's actually in the action scenes pretty good kind of um the action scenes here are proficient there's not much excitement with them but they are well directed by roar uthaug uh who has my favorite name of all time um he directed the wave a couple a couple years ago which i never saw but i heard that it was pretty good it was a, a disaster movie uh set in europe um and somehow got a wide release over here just crazy but now he's got this huge release um and you know he 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 directs it pretty well pretty pretty proficiently uh there's this great action scene where um uh laura is being chased through the woods and then she jumps into the river and uh she's washed away in the river and then she comes up and and bumps against like and holds on to a big uh plane that has crashed and is literally sitting on the edge of the waterfall, and then it plunges into the waterfall. It's a really great, like, how it builds. It's a really, really solid action scene, but the problem is that it's also kind of not exciting. There's no tension in the scene. It's just it's just proficient filmmaking. It's sort of like that's the statement where, you know, you look at the piano player who's playing the piece perfectly, but there's no soul. Like, there's no... He's just playing it perfectly and proficiently, that's how that's how the action scenes here feel. They're they're well filmed, they're well choreographed, but there's no excitement. There's no feeling. There's no soul to it. It's just kind of there. It's just happening on screen. And then when you 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 know you pair that with this dumb plot, um, you know, involving the villain and the obvious you know climax where they they get together and fight each other and all that. It just kind of sits there on the screen. It's not it, – there's really not much to say <laughs> here. This is why it's going to be such a short review. In fact, I, this honestly like my like, – like let's say we had originally – we had done what we were going to do originally, Chase, where we were both going to review Tomb Raider and then I was just going to do a separate review of Love, Simon. I'm glad that we switched 
because um, my review of Love, Simon alone would have been longer than both of our reviews of this movie. That's how that's how anonymous and completely bland this thing is. <laughs> now, the the undeniable positive is Alicia Vikander. She commits to this role where literally everybody else does not. Uh, there's in the performance, she has this determination to introduce a bit of mischief into the into her personality. You know, she's very young. I think that the character is about twenty, twenty one. Um, so this is a much. This is, I think this is a slightly younger Lara Croft than the other one, and she still has that kind of kiddish sensibility, right? And so she's able to incorporate a lot of mischief, and I think that that was a smart decision because it means that she has more than one level. With the Angelina Jolie Lara Croft, she was a complete cipher. There, you didn't know anything about her. You didn't get a, a sense of her personality, and it, it, the movie kind the movies both kind of struggled for that reason. It, what, they just didn't have a compelling lead, and here you do have a compelling lead in a completely uncompelling movie otherwise. Um, and so you know, it's whatever. It's just kind of it's just kind of there. Uh, Alicia Vikander's good. There's some well choreographed, but not very, not very exciting action. Uh, but then again, it's not something I could ever hate. It's just I can't go below a C on this. Basically, like that's it's just a C movie. Like <laughs> it's that, just that's a C even movie. more offensive than a bad movie. <laughs> it is. It is absolutely. I like literally. I could not. So I try to make my reviews as long as I can, but try to keep them within one document page on word right you know just like fit in as much as i can sometimes it works uh, out so well that i write like a page and a half this one was four paragraphs and it was <laughs> not even 500 words because there's nothing to say about this movie and i was i was really stretching and so yeah it's it's just one of those bland you know it's a programmer that's a that's a term that i love uh, that a friend of mine uses for these kind of mid-90s-esque action movies that's completely anonymous totally just there to be programmed literally that's that's where it comes from programmed onto hbo to play at like eight or nine p.m you know that's that's the that's the kind of movie this is you're gonna catch it on hbo it's completely inoffensive but there's nothing new here there's nothing involving there's nothing engrossing it just sits there being its proficient kind of dully proficient self and um and it's kind of sad too because you know it's a movie with a female action lead, but it's one of those where it would be the same thing if Lara Croft were a man. Like it, it's it, it, just the movie as is. Whoever's in the lead, it still has all of these problems with it. And um, anyway, so didn't hate it, didn't like it, whatever. I'd give it a C, um, and I'll probably forget it by next month. It's sort of the same thing with Hurricane House last weekend. It's it's the same ex- it's, it's the same exact situation. I'm just I, gonna I forget it by the end of the year. It. You'll forget it by the time we uh, get done recording. Um, so <laughs> what did I? What did I just review? <laughs> you you reviewed uh, Hurricane Heist too. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, you know it is what it is. I'm not gonna ever watch it. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. So what did you guys think of uh, Love Simon and Tomb Raider? Please let us know down below. Uh, obviously, we loved Love Simon more. All right. So getting into the the numbers that matter and why I am angry that Fox had four promo screenings for love simon <clears throat> all right so so give me the hints the uh yeah the hints so for your top 10 the new releases that are in there somewhere love simon tomb raider and i can only imagine okay oh boy oh, okay I, okay i see where this is going um oh, yes you do oh boy all right thinking about the previous weeks all right, I'm going to go from one to five this time, just kind of because I think that Black Panther is still number one. Uh, I bet money on that. I'm, I'm going to say Black Panther's number one, Tomb Raider's number two. Hmm. Oh boy, is I can only imagine at number three. No, maybe not that high. Um. came out last week oh wrinkle in time number three wrinkle in time is number three um i'm gonna say i can only imagine made the top five so i'm gonna say i can only imagine is number four and 
Strangers Pray at Night at number five. That's, <laughs> that's probably a terrible guess. But Okay, you were doing fine, uh, but I'll tell you where you screwed up. All right, okay. uh, so Strangers Pray at Night is actually at number eight. It dropped oh, 53%. No. Um, oh, no. That's fine for that movie. I mean, it's made $18 million on a budget don't, of like don't, $2. Don't horror, movies, don't horror movies tend to do that, though? Oh, yeah. Kind they, of, they like in their time. second weekend. Yeah, okay. Then that doesn't surprise me. I guess I... I guess I should have been thinking about that when I guessed that. <laughs> uh, listen, I, I love the movie quite a bit, and I think it's amazing that that movie has almost made $20 million on a budget of $5, so yeah, you know, $5. good for it. Um, all right, so here we go. Number five, Love, Simon. Oh, it did make the top five. Yes. Okay. See, I was uh, thinking maybe it was number six, so that's why I just didn't say that. But. Well, uh, it was a clear jump from six to five, but <sighs> here's the problem, folks. When you have four promo screenings, you're going to open up with $11 million. Oh. That's bad. Uh, especially when you have, like, you know, this type of coming-of-age film on a wide scale. Its budget is $17 million, and but here's the Ooh. kicker. I'm going to double that, and I'm almost going to double that uh, to about 60 70 ish because the marketing for this movie was all yeah. over the place. And those Crazy promo screenings are not cheap, by the way. They right. are not cheap. So... I'm yeah, say, people don't understand that the promo screenings, like preview screenings and stuff, they cost money. Yeah. They, they Like even maybe not press screenings. I, I don't know if those do, but certainly the ones where they invite people to see it. I mean, those those are part of the P&A. So, yeah, it's crazy. It, well, it's like if, if you have four promo screenings and that's per city across the country, that adds up. So I just – I don't – I don't understand why they had so many, but on a – uh, production budget of 17 double that to 34 i'm gonna say double that to about almost damn near 70 million dollars to break even making 11 opening weekend is not good so i'm hoping this word of mouth in our review amongst everyone else's reviews please go see it uh if not this movie is going to crush on uh uh itunes probably and yeah. i don't want it to wait that long like please show right. this movie support uh in a you know wide release theater it's just guys come on all right Number four, this is where Joel screwed up, A Wrinkle in Time. Oh, wow. Okay. 16.5 million, 50% drop, by the way. Um, its budget is probably uh, $100 billion with all that VFX work <laughs> uh, and Oprah Winfrey. Um, but right now, it's domestically at 61 mil, worldwide 71. Still got a long way to go. I don't even have, I don't even have the brain power to think about that math. All right, number three, I can only imagine... With mm. seventeen million uh, on a budget of seven, double that with its five million in marketing because I don't think it advertised anywhere. Yeah. It's already damn well made its uh, money back. So whatever. Um, we can we can um, we can expect and I can only imagine further, or I oh can only God. imagine more, or I can only imagine also. Oh, it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be the next God's Not Dead franchise. <laughs> All right, number two is. Tomb Raider with twenty three point five million, um, on a budget of ninety four. Not yeah, good stateside, but here's the catch: it's got some worldwide numbers. Worldwide, it's at one twenty six. Oh, okay. So it actually made a hundred million dollars opening our foreign territory. So do we know if that's probably China? It's probably mostly China. <laughs> yeah, because or, I know um, China. China eats up video game adaptations. Oh, they they yeah. just they that's love them. Warcraft. I mean, Warcraft yeah. yeah. That's um, how they're making a sequel to Warcraft in China. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, the budget is ninety-four million. You double that to one eighty-six with its marketing. Probably fifty to seventy-five, I'd say. Yeah, because yeah. I don't know if they spent a hundred million dollars worth on that. I mean, yeah, it was probably a crap ton. So I, I'm going to say conservatively two fifty to break even on a worldwide t- haul of 126 that's not bad i think it'll actually yeah. have some legs uh going forward and you, and you know i'm actually kind of interested in a sequel i think that uh, as much as i kind of thought that this first one was bland they have room for improvement and they have a good character yeah. with lara croft and i think that you know they'll make enough here that they'll be able to make a sequel and i'm interested to see if they improve on them on the on this movie i think it's absolutely possible and so I, I will only watch it if it's on Netflix. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, and the number one, of course, for the fifth week in a row, Black Panther was seventy. Uh, no, twenty-seven million. <laughs> I almost had dyslexia there. Sorry. Uh, twenty-seven million. Get this. Domestically, it's at six oh five. 
which, by the way, if you're keeping track, that's $18 million away from beating the Avengers. That wow. is insane. So, Isn't it like the fourth um, highest grossing, domestically speaking, right? Or something like that? It's so insane. right now, because I, I know everyone's curious out there, domestically, here are the, the movies at play. Number one is The Force Awakens with 936. Avatar is at 760. Titanic is at 659. Jurassic World's at number four with 652. The Avengers is at number five with 623. Number six is The Last Jedi with 619. And Black Panther is sitting at number seven with 605. Okay, okay. So I knew it, that it was in the top ten already. Cause yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's creeping up there. And I, I will bet you money that it will go past The Last Jedi, go past The Avengers, and maybe reach Jurassic World. But I don't think it's going to go anywhere beyond Avengers, probably. Yeah, probably, probably not. At least not in theaters. Um, yeah. So, so that, well, that's, that's really good. <laughs> that's great. That's yeah. great stuff. Any any big rises, drops, or any interesting other? Uh, um, uh, let me check here. Uh, well, and just real quick on Black Panther, it's made about one point one eight billion. Okay. Ridiculous. Uh, yeah. All right. Ridiculous. So big drops. Don't really see any uh, big um, pluses. We have the death of Stalin. Uh, got a 214% raise with 28 nice. theaters added. Not bad for uh, coming in at 19th place with 580 grand. It's not bad okay. for that type of movie. That's good. Um, yeah, we, we both – when did you watch that, by the way? I watched it yesterday. Uh, yeah, see, same here. <laughs> so <laughs> so there, there you go. Yeah, we, we both watched that. We're reviewing that uh, next weekend for those who read our stuff um, at uh, Dallas Movie Screenings. That will be on our next uh, – our next review. Well, one we of also next have a week. joint review of Flower, which also yes. was a new release uh, this week. Um, came in at number thirty-five with okay. fifty-seven thousand dollars in three theaters. <laughs> that <laughs> so. is what it. That is what it deserves. Uh, I. I will just say I was not Whoops. a fan of that movie. Um, also, a weird surplus. Uh, it lost forty-two theaters, but gained forty-two percent. Wonder, <laughs> like what? Uh, okay. Um, I, I that wonder was how that happened. It was Understood. already out in uh, DVD, so I don't know why I did that. And oh, and this this is a great shock. It gained twenty one theaters and it rose thirty one percent. The Leisure Seeker. No, <laughs> stop it. Um, uh, it's that's... all these. It's all these people who like like pay attention to what you say and then do the opposite. That's that's what I'm thinking. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I I hate that. Um. Anyways, that's <laughs> about it. So guys. That will do it for episode 222. Uh, let us know all your comments and thoughts down below. And then for next week, 223 is, uh, of course, uh, March 23rd weekend there, um, our show on the 25th. Joel, what are we doing next week? Yeah, we're doing it a day early, first of all. Uh, it's not going to be on Sunday. It's going to be on Saturday, so we won't have box office results. But we are doing Unsane, which is the new Steven Soderbergh movie. looks 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 unsane. So I'm I'm really excited. I'm I think I'm seeing it Thursday night. Hopefully, if it does Thursday night previews. So yeah, and then I'm I'm going to be doing an extra review of Pacific Rim Uprising, which is sort of like Tomb Raider in that neither of us had any interest. <laughs> so we decided to go with the more interesting wide release. Well, um, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint Joel and the uh, millions of listeners that we have, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing Pacific Rim 2 on Tuesday at a screening, and oh, okay. uh, I will have my full review on my YouTube channel, uh, oh, and Joel yeah. will have his quick review here. But um, yes, we will be reviewing Unsane. Can't wait. I'm seeing it Thursday night as well. And that's a great uh, way to kind of bleed into our social media. Um, Joel, where can the people find you online? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at Real Joel Copeland. That's R E E L J O E L C O P L I N G. Um, and then on Letterboxd at Jay Copeling, you can find some of my writing at Dallas Movie Screenings. We are the official podcast for that website. Um, we, Like I said, we got a couple coming up next weekend. And then uh, on my website, I not only reviewed these two movies, I also reviewed um, uh, Thoroughbreds, which is another top ten contender. I'd give that one an, an, an A- as well. A uh, great movie with probably what's going to be the best performance of the year from the late Anton Yelchin. Um, great, great role. One of the one of those like once in a blue moon great performances. I'm I'm genuinely like not saying that because he's no longer with us. He's amazing. Uh, so I reviewed that, and I've got my Iron Man two review up as well. So you can check that out there. 
Yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Real Chase Lee. Subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can get all of the reviews I don't do on this show, which is quite frequently, uh, like The Leisure Seeker. Go check it out. It's 20 minutes long. Um, and uh, uh, Also, you know, this uh, podcast is on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud. We are everywhere. Please spread it around and let people know this is the Definitive Movie Podcast. You go for all your movie tidbits and knowledge, yo. And thank you for joining in uh, this community of Real Me In, the crazy community that it is. Um, we appreciate you new listeners, uh, old listeners. You guys are all awesome, and we will see you guys next week for Unsane and Pacific Rim 2 Uprising. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, Joel, any last words? Not really. Oh, thank you for that weak <laughs> outro. All right, so we'll see you guys next week. I'll see y'all, I'll see y'all later. Y'all are awesome. I love, I love all of our listeners. There we go. Well, there you go. You're working on it. All right, so uh, all the links will be in the description below. Let's play the outro music. Uh, and please, 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 please go see Love, Simon. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye. Okay, I think the cameras worked.